thanks everyone and uh, apologies for the technical challenges um, and welcome to the HSRC um, session on macroeconomics of, of the UBIC. Um, so just to introduce the topic, we met with the president in January last year as a civil society coalition uh, to discuss economic pathways towards a system of basic income. And that meeting led to the decision to uh, embark on a research process to look at these pathways and to determine what were the most viable and impactful pathways. So a little more, more than a year after the meeting with the president, we're here to discuss the macroeconomic implications of introducing a big and to look at the scenarios modeled by Asghar Adelzada from the ADRS, as well as leading uh, thinkers, researchers, and policymakers, uh, including from presidency and the Department of Social Development um, uh, uh, in, in, in the country. This is critical uh, work and engagement to help inform policymakers and South Africa at large about the options before us. The evidence is critically important, the research is critical. Applying our minds to the policy options is indispensable. But we also need to remind ourselves as policymakers, researchers, and academics that this is about much more than economic ratios and technical debates. The proposals that we make and the decisions that we take on basic income will have a fundamental impact on the lives of millions, possibly tens of millions fellow South Africans. We're talking about basic income and livelihoods in a country where over half the population, that is over 30 million, live in poverty, and at least 25% don't have enough income to buy sufficient food to live a healthy life. Therefore, the policy options we choose could benefit a small fraction of these groups or assist the overwhelming majority to escape poverty and destitution. The cruel, exclusionary, and stingy approach uh, currently to the social relief of dist distress grant, as important as this grant is, shows the damaging impact of inappropriate policy choices. The economic pathways before us today call on us to approach this debate with the people of this country front and center. Yes, macroeconomic balances are important, However, if there are options before us which both allow expansive interventions to fight the scourge of poverty and ensure all round economic development, as opposed to narrow, ultra cautious, and short term approaches to macroeconomic um, questions, it should be clear which perspective should guide us. I always remember a comment made by a leading uh, academic, Hajun Chang. Uh, who's at the London School of Economics, who said that our country, that South Africa's macroeconomic policies and the policymakers are paralyzed by caution, to quote him. No macroeconomic policies are without risks or externalities, including the current policy uh, pathway, which government and national treasury have embarked on, which is itself riddled with risks. And we are seeing those risks unfold in abundance at the moment. The choices we take, we take are driven by the interests of those that the policy choices we make serve. So the question is, whose interests are we putting front and center? We need to learn the lessons of history and multiple countries that have embraced bold development interventions to emerge from poverty. And one can cite multiple examples from uh, China to East Asia, to the New Deal in, in the US, to uh, Europe post-war, et, et cetera. Finally, this means avoiding false binaries. It's not about jobs versus social protection, industrial policies versus income transfers. We need to be able to hold two thoughts in our heads at once. Policies properly designed will be mutually reinforcing. So as we embark on this journey, let us make the policy choices and trade-offs that listen to and are in the interests of the people we want to benefit. 
So with those introductory remarks, I just want to thank everybody present, uh, thank the HSRC for convening this uh, forum, uh, in particular to thank Asghar Adelzada and the ADRS for the excellent work they have done on the modeling, which we will see the initial results of today, which will be followed by a paper by uh, Asghar and, and, and IEJ on the issues that are being presented. Uh, to thank the funders, FES, who've made the UBIC work of IEJ possible. To thank the DSD and Presidency for, set, for sending uh, high-level um, uh, officials to engage in this discussion. Of course, the speakers and pan panelists, the IEJ UBIC team who have worked tirelessly uh, on this particular issue, as well as the uh, other work that has been done uh, by the Institute for Economic Justice. Uh, so with that, I want to hand over to uh, Dr. Peter Jacobs, if he is uh, online, um, if he's not able to connect, then perhaps he can make his introductory comments later and we can move to the next session. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Neil, for uh, welcoming everybody. And yes, I am online and connected. I do hope that everybody else on the uh, other side can hear me as well as all the other attendees in this uh, particular forum. Uh, I have uh, just a small number of uh, remarks to say or the comments to make. Firstly, I want to thank the uh, IEJ colleagues for working very closely with us over the last couple of years in uh, putting forward and broadening the public debate around uh, a basic income guarantee, a basic income grant, in a society, as you've already outlined there, is really in need of such uh, a social protection measure and uh, mechanism. However, as we've highlighted in the previous uh, rounds of conversations on the UBIG, that there are lots of unanswered questions still around this from a societal point of view. Today's conversation is really trying to extend that uh, debate a little bit further. Why? Because we don't often think of you big or social protection as integral to macroeconomic policy making and macroeconomic policy decisions. So for us, this is a brave and really courageous move to say that the macroeconomic policy debate and toolbox should actually be opened. It cannot be confined to interest rates, inflation rate, and occasionally adjusting taxation. It's far bigger than that. Actually, macroeconomics is at the heart of how a society actually operates. And understanding the principles of macroeconomics, it's actually very, very important. And there are very strong linkages between macroeconomic principles and social protection. And the specific area of social protection that we're going to discuss today is on uh, you big. Now, those linkages will all be, I think, teased out by the real good group of presenters that we have and people to share some of their ideas and thoughts with us. But the macroeconomic policy debate in the HSRC is something that I'd love to say one or two things about. Our macroeconomic policy dialogues have been going on for the last three years, and this is the sixth dialogue session that we're having specifically to open up the debate on macroeconomic policy making and macroeconomic policy thinking, and not to confine this or limit this to one or two uh, you know, agencies or institutes. Uh, macroeconomic policy making is far more important uh, and important from a social point of view, just to leave it to one or two individuals or one or two agencies. So the HSRC enters the macroeconomic policy debate with a specific focus on poverty, inequality and unemployment. In other words, we have a very clear perspective on macroeconomic policy, where we're coming from. And when we talk about macroeconomic policy, we do not want to dissociate itself from or macroeconomic policy principles from the big societal questions that we confronted with. We've had in previous macroeconomic policies, one or two of the uh, prestigious speakers who will be part of the panel today, but the most uh, recent macroeconomic policy dialogue debate that we had was on the macroeconomic policy of industrial development or industrial policy. 
The macroeconomic policy dialogues will carry forward and we've got two lined up uh, for the current year. The next one will be on the macroeconomic policy of infrastructure development, which is of course highly pertinent given the current uh, debates around the future of ESCOM and other uh, state-owned entities that are really central to the infrastructural development or infrastructural uh, functionality of South Africa. The one thereafter will take up the all contentious topic of public debt, the macroeconomics of public debt. And once again, you will see through all these themes that we're bringing macroeconomic policy debates back to where it belongs, to all the issues that influence the economy in a broader sense, and not merely one or two isolated items in macroeconomic policy debates and discussions. So uh, we welcome all the uh, panelists. We welcome uh, everybody else as part of the attendees online and those uh, in the auditorium or VCR room in Pretoria. And the, the dialogues or the symposium is what we framed it as today, are aimed at facilitating debate and discussion and opening it up. A number of papers will be produced as uh, the IEJ uh, Neil already stated but these will be made available to further and promote the uh, societal conversation that we want to have. So this is about opening up bigger debates and conversations that should be taking place in our society. And the HSRC is playing a key role with a very, very important and highly valued partner, the IEJ, in opening up this debate. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Peter. Um, we are moving on to the next session. I don't uh, know, Vandasai, are you sharing? Um, the, we're waiting for Brenda Sebeko, who seems to have been uh, sort of uh, stuck uh, in traffic. So Kelly, Dr. Kelly Harson from the IJ, will introduce the session and we'll see if we can uh, assist uh, uh, DG, DG Sebeko to to, to, to enter the place, and if you want to go. Thanks, Neil. Why don't you? So let's hope that in the time it takes me to introduce this session, um, Brenda will arrive. I understood that she was simply stuck in traffic on the way here. Um, but she should be here any second. Um, but this session is intended to be an introduction to basic income grant debates in South Africa. Um, and as I think we are all aware, uh, debates concerning the need for social protection and assistance have gained renewed prominence um, in the wake of, of COVID-19 and, and our intersecting uh, crises of unemployment poverty and inequality. Um, policy proposals for social protection reforms vary widely, but the overarching uh, rationale is, um, of course, to ensure that there's a, a standard of living poor below which no one in South Africa can fall. The most far-reaching and ambitious proposal that expanded social protection that is currently being debated is possibly the Universal Basic Income Guarantee, Universal Basic Income Grant, UBIG. And in broad terms, this refers to a policy of providing regular cash transfers to everybody in society to cover basic living costs. Uh, in South Africa, concrete policy proposals for a UBIG have suggested that it could supplement the existing social grant system to provide a minimum level of income to those between the ages of 18 and 59, the majority of whom do not currently have access to social protection, despite being widely affected by and vulnerable to unemployment. So South Africa is, as we have heard in the President's State of the Nation address uh, and in other um, public forums and statements, highly likely to introduce some form of permanent basic income support, um, possibly within the next two years. 
And there is a possibility that this could eventually take the form of a UVIC. Um, we've heard support for a UVIC emanating from various spheres of influence. It was uh, adopted as a resolution at the ANC's policy conference last year. Uh, as we have heard from Neil and Peter, this juncture has raised critical questions and concerns relating to where social protection fits into the macro economy and particularly its complex linkages to GDP growth, fiscal policy, and cost of living crises. Luckily, uh, Brenda has arrived just in time. <laughs> no, not a problem. Um, so the question of whether the economy and the tax base can sustain a UVIC has been hotly debated, as has the question of possible negative macroeconomic impacts of new progressive taxation measures, such as a wealth tax. Proponents of UBIG have suggested that it can spark a virtuous cycle of economic growth, whereas opponents have argued that it is ultimately unaffordable and could trigger further fiscal crisis. The answers to these questions are complicated by specificities of design. What would the transfer value be set at? Uh, what are the intermediary steps on the path to realizing a UVIC? These questions are hotly contested with polarized views both within and outside government. And at the very center of this contestation is the Department of Social Development, which especially since the introduction of the Social Relief of Distress Grant has been in a position of navigating increased complexity in the grant system and the need for accelerated policy development amidst competing political pressures. So few people are better placed then to provide an overview of current basic income grant debates in South Africa than DSD, DDG for Social Security, Brenda Sebeko. Brenda is responsible for social security policy, including work on existing social grants and motivating for the extension of coverage to the working, to working age population. We are very glad Brenda could join us today, and it's my pleasure to uh, hand over the floor to her. Good, good morning, and thank you very much for having me. It's, it's a privilege to actually be able to speak at this uh, symposium. Um, apologies for being so late. <laughs> my house is flooded, so I was trying to sort that out and get someone to come in and please look at what's wrong before coming here. Apologies. Um, um, I prepared a presentation, so maybe I, I don't know if I should just talk through it or do you want me to write it? I'm easy either way. I'm easy either way. Um, maybe maybe talk through talk it, through it uh, Brenda, yeah. and we can post it afterwards. Right, of course, it's right, got to be posted right. on yeah, Zoom. To... It's got to be posted on sure. Zoom. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. Right. So, so, so I thought that I should start with. Um, kind of context in this moment so that I organize my thinking and speaking. So it's <laughs> Yeah, I'll send it to you. It's fine. You can do that. It's fine. But um, the, the approach that I thought I should take is first to just give a contextual background for, from, from our side and then talk through a few of the proposals that have come through, including the ones that DSD itself has made. And, and then some point as to where we are hoping to go from DSD. So that says the, says the um, background a bit. So to begin with, I think this is a quote that is worth a uh, my yes. This is the quote that, that that is really worth repeating. I'm, I'm audible, no? Probably. But sure. A simple vote without food, shelter, and health care is to use first generation right as a smooth stream to obscure the deep underlying forces which dehumanize people. It is to create an appearance of equality and justice, while by implication, socioeconomic inequality is entrenched. We do not want freedom without bread, nor do we want bread without freedom. 
we must provide for all the fundamental rights and freedoms associated with a democratic society. I don't think I would need to pay anyone for guessing who that is. Because uh, Nelson Mandela, which which in a way sets the ethos and the and, and the perspective that informs DSG's views around why we need to behave in, we need to implement these income support in the country. The fact that we have democrat, democracy in the sense of people being able to vote is not adequate, does not in fact guarantee uh, freedom when people do not have to do it. And so this is part of the reason why we are pursuing this, this um, agenda. So, so you are aware of course that the debate has been going on for a very long time in South Africa as in the rest of the world. Um, for us, it started, it started just before the job summit of 1998, when the recommendation was made there that we should have a big thing from that. Um, and, and a lot of the technical work was only done by the Taylor Committee in 2000, 2000, 2002, um, where they proposed a very simple, very, very simple um, grant, which was 100 percent to be given immediately, which, I mean, without any means test, without any kind of um, qualification criteria would have been a very simple way to immediately address the income needs of people at that stage. Sadly, it was not supported at cabinet level and therefore did not get it. Cabinet decided that the priority instead is to rather focus on children, who at that stage were also not getting income support. So the, the decision was let's rather focus on income support. And then after that, let's, um, de-racialize the existing social security system at this point, and then also to age equalize for people who to, for, for, for the older age grant, which previously used to have a criteria of 65 years of age for men, and then 60 for women. So the decision was let's equalize because the constitution says we should not discriminate on the basis of, on the basis of gender. So that was done, um, but the, 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 the BIG argument did not succeed and did not get implemented for a long time. Um, between 2000 and 2020, uh, 2020 rather, we as government have been extending social funds because we started at, at around 2.4 million then, and we have now reached more than 80 million. But this is for the grants that focus on children, people with disability, and that's, those are the people that are deemed to um, in, a, in a sense, deserve you know, if, if you look at the, what, the kind of policy stance that sometimes government expresses when it deals with people who are actually some, who are working age. The idea is that they should go and work for and, and income from labor, and therefore they should not they should not get social assistance. Of course, this is not this is contrary to what our constitution says. The difficulty, though, is that since I can remember, since since democracy onset there has been a difficulty in being able to get everybody into it. The unemployment problem in South Africa is structural in nature, it has just grown. Uh, all, the, all the job creation that has happened between 2000 and now has not even made a dent to the kind of need for jobs in the country. Um, inequality has also grown, primarily because the structural nature of inequality in the country from apartheid has not really been changed. Some of the interventions that we have done have not had the structural impact that is required to be able to really deal with inequality properly. So it just keeps reproducing itself over, over the period. Um, and then when COVID happened, the, the plight of those people who are not getting any kind of social assistance became very stark because they are the ones who are doing very um, menial work, uh, survivalist uh, pro, uh, businesses, or informal work or very low paid work. And the majority of them lost those jobs during the COVID pandemic. So the COVID SRD grant was a, a decision made by government to basically address that gap of people who lost their jobs due to, and due, due to COVID. However, a lot of the people who became beneficiaries of COVID SRD were not in fact people who lost their jobs due to COVID. They had in any case been unemployed, some of them for a very long time. So this created some sort of income support for them. Um, and, and the issue is it's still temporary. Although it's been implemented every year, you know, 
the fact of the matter is government has taken a stand that this is a temporary measure. There has not been commitment yet to actually implement it based in terms of what is permanent and reliable people. So, so as a result of this large proportion of people not having consistent income, also not having jobs, there's low participation, obviously, in the economy, which has an impact on the growth trajectory of the country, on equity, on, on just decent lives of people because they live in very poor circumstances. So, so the COVID-19 grant for, for, for government became, it is for DSD, became something that we could use as a basis or as a motivator to say, in fact, government can find money if there's political money, government can find money and it can in fact introduce a basic income grant. We did a lot of research from within government, but also there is civil society organizations also did some, some research, including IEJ, um, which found various uh, positive uh, results from the SRD grant. For, for DSD's uh, research, one of the important things we found was that more than 90% of the beneficiaries actually use the grant for food, which says a lot about the levels of hunger in the country. That 350, although it's well below the food poverty line of 624, was very key <clears throat> to helping people just to be able to eat on a day to day basis. The person who did this qualitative work was right behind me, um, Dr. Magasella. And we also found that a, a lot of the people who were interviewed, who, who were asked about their views on the SDG, were saying, actually, you should give it to everybody who helps. We had some criteria that was established in order to make sure that you prioritize the most needy. But the fact of the matter is, uh, even people who are in employment are in very low incomes, which are difficult to live on, especially under the current circumstances of increasing food prices and so on. So, so there's, a, there's a general sense among a lot of civil society groups that we should be using the SRG grant as a basis to extend, the, to extend and to introduce a basic income grant. We also found in the research that we did that was done also by, by other stakeholders in its national income dynamics study that the grant not only reduced uh, poverty or the proportion of people living below poverty, but it also increased uh, uh, reduced inequality, actually to the level that the NDP 2030 goal aims for, which means if we were to really commit, we could, in fact, by just making this allocation a permanent, really important inequality in the country quite significantly. Because uh, the argument still has to be about how, uh, how you will then be able to fund it. But you've been able to show, I, th I think I won't go through the arguments for because, uh, or, or, or why it's important to do it, primarily because I think the audience in here has, has had a lot of engagement about what is the motivation, the, the poverty impact, the inequality impact, experiences in other countries that have been done. Um, but the fact is there aren't a lot of countries in fact that have been doing this. Uh, there's only a few that, it, that, that, that have implemented it. One being, it's not even a country, the state. I think it's the most famous example of the basic income uh, grant in, in Alaska. Um, it continues to be quite successful, paid primarily from, 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 from I think it's all, all, all revenues, yeah. And then Iran had some income support program also, um, but they, I mean, it, it was also introduced during, is it uh, maybe Nadab, the, the previous president of Iran, but they've started to sort of erode it and reduce it and so on in, in, under the current government. Mongolia tried their experiment, well, it wasn't an experiment, it was an actual implementation. We started with children and then extended to adults. But then they had to scale it back because they actually couldn't afford it. So that, those are lessons for us to learn about where you pitch it and the pace by over, through which you do the basic income around. <laughs> and other countries have, have just piloted it. Um, and then Brazil is a useful example for Africa. So their trajectory has been followed. They started obviously with the, the, the small grant for children, but it's the Escola, Bolsa uh, Escola, which they then expanded to cover all families, uh, poor families, also familiar. Then they expanded it even further, but not for the whole country. The expansion was only for, for, for one city in Rio. And it covers not a large number of people, but the findings of, of, of that um, implementation are positive. It gives give us some ideas of 
the sort of benefit that we can derive in the country if we were to implement it. The, the, the value is not very high, like 31 million dollars, not a lot of money, but it is important for poor people to have that steady income that they can depend on um, every for, for their daily living. The advantages of, of having this have been um, across different implementations and even pilots or, or experiments. The findings are sort of similar of what the benefits are and what the impacts are. We find that cost, it, it impact on economic growth positive, household poverty and nutrition improves. Those people who are getting the, the money always in the majority of cases will be raised and on good for food. It has been known to also increase school attendance. The, 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 the impact that is really important for South Africa, given the states that were in issues of gender-based violence and, and women, the women states have been surprised to the fact that poverty in South Africa is actually female, largely and black. And um, one of the one of the positive impacts that have been found in income support, not just as a basic income plan, but different types of income support, is that in fact it just reduced the dependency of women on men and gives them that freedom to be able to come out of um, abusive relationships. And, and that's a very important thing. And it also, in family relations, gives those people who, who otherwise not have an income, some sort of voice and decision-making, um, the possibility to also contribute to decision-making, not just be recipient and have no agency in their own lives. We think these two things are really important for in the kind of society that we have. But others have argued that there might be some unintended consequences. The naysayers would argue that when you give people money that they have not worked for and become lazy, or that they they will just use it for what is called temptation goods, like alcohol, cigarettes, and so on. Um, I mean, the evidence is not strong to suffer that that is exactly the case. If it is, it's not sufficiently strong to warrant not implementing the, the grant. In South Africa, the IEJ has been at the forefront of a whole lot of research, of course, um, which has sort of supported and backed up some of the research that DSD itself has done through the expert panel. Um, we, we did two bits of research with the expert panel, um, but there's also been other people who, who have been doing work on, on social on, on social grants and on the basic income support proposal. From our side, the initial work that we did that the SRD 350 grant was to look at whether in fact you could uh, scale up the, the, the 350 grant and, and use that as a basis for the basic income support in the country. We appointed a panel of experts to do this work for us. We tested a whole lot of scenarios, but they concluded that yes, in fact, you could um, implement the basic income grant. Um, they, their findings were a bit conservative though, in that they argued that you shouldn't go full speed ahead initially. Take, take time and, 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 and scale up over time rather than immediately implementing sorry, a basic income grant, primarily because they were looking at the current fiscal space and arguing that there isn't sufficient budget unless you borrow or, or look for external funding to be able to fund it immediately, given the scale that it's required. So the, the, the proposal from their side was that you should rather scale up slowly, but starting with a 350 grant. I'm going to the then the IEJ, you know the position there. The IEJ is arguing for a universal basic income grant, land means tested. Remember, if, if the, the, the panel is proposing that we should be building on the SRG grant, they're in effect saying you need to start with the targeted income because the SRG grant is targeted, it's, it's means tested, very, very strict criteria that you put there, which some, some of us actually regret, but so be it, um, given the kind of policy space that you operate in. Um, so, so the, the IEJ proposal is that you should rather go for a universal um, basic income grant. They've done the costing and so on, arguing that, of course, this immediately fulfills the constitutional mandate, which we agree with, which is in recipients more effectively, we agree with that. Also deals with issues of the, the complexities of means that we avoid all the inclusion and exclusion errors. I think inclusion errors are harder to, to avoid, but in, in, a, in a universal system, because tax law back, it requires you to really be able to do very well, to have very good systems in place to do tax law back for higher income earners. But 
it's easier to implement a universal form of that than all the systems and, and testing and all that, so on that we, we have been looking at from the DLD side. Also that, um, I mean, this one is agreed by all people who are, who are having either for universal or just a targeted income grants, that it would have positive irreversibility effects if financed correctly, or it's not through VAT. So there's also agreement on that one. Um, some people though have alluded Notably, uh, people from Saldo, uh, Borat, Ostensen, and Stan Stanwix, those uh, colleagues from UCT. Also, some economists such as, well, Busa, they're not economists, Busa, Business Union, South Africa, uh, Intellidex, although, I mean, their arguments are not very thoroughly, they're not very technically strong, the arguments that they make, but they make arguments in any case against the VIG. Then there's Michael Sex, who was part of the uh, team that has been writing on, on, on the basic income grant. The, their argument is primarily around fiscal sustainability, arguing that um, if you introduce this basic income grant, you need to go for debt financing because there isn't money that you have to pay for it. And the argument is that we are already at a very high debt to GDP ratio. We should not include it further. And we don't share that view, but that's the view from the people who oppose uh, the, the BIG. Others also argue that it will crowd out other kinds of expenditure in the country uh, expenditure on healthcare, expenditure on education, and so on. We have to reduce in order to fund the basic income grant. Um, yeah, and then there's the CDE, which argues that, in fact, we are already spending too much on. That's, you know, that we already spending too much on clients, we should not spend any more. And then there's an argument that says, if you over, if you, so if you fund it through tax, you will then have a negative impact on the economy in that investment will go down. But also that people who, who have the means will actually leave the country, very high income people emigrate. This is, I mean, this is a, what, one of the arguments that are, that are raised. Also, that it will distort the labor market, and that uh, people who would otherwise look for work will stop looking for work because there's living in income. Yeah, this is an argument that has been advanced against all sorts of income support, not just the UP necessarily. Um, so, so these arguments we've had, uh, there's there's a lot more argument for the basic income in the country. Um, the, the variation in the argument is primarily about whether it should be universal. <laughs> or means tested or targeted. That's where the, the, the key argument lies. And then there's also debate about what the funding options need to be. Whether it should be VAT, it should be different types of taxes, PIT, wealth tax, and so on, some of which the ING has advanced, or, or whether it should be through debt financing. So, so while there's, there's a strong lobby and a strong support for a basic income grant, there isn't a, a uniform view of what that should look like, the shape that the basic income grant should take in the country. Um, so, so the detail of it will be, uh, be in the document when you get it. But the national treasury, which is key in deciding, uh, although this is supposed to be like a whole government decision, there's a very strong view from the national treasury, which says that actually the bigger challenge that I have is not going to expect unemployment. And that all resources of government should be targeted at increasing employment rather than increasing the amount of money that's spent in grants. Um, the argument being that a 34% unemployment rate is unsustainable. It's part of the, the primary reason why the growth in the country is not is anemic to, to put it mildly. So, so the argument is that we should rather prioritize employment creation. The problem though is that. There's work that has been done, I haven't put it in the presentation, but by, by the World Bank, which shows that in the past, since around 2020, 2021, the amount of money that government has spent in different programs, job in and job creation and active labor market spending is in the region of 100 billion. But the problem is the impact of those has not been very strong because firstly, there's fragmentation, there's poor targeting, and, and some of these projects are not been some of these programs are not even measured or evaluated. So, so it's difficult to say you can replace the, the, the basic income grant or any kind of income support with those programs. Furthermore, the number of jobs created in total 
is not even 20% of what's required in terms of the unemployment numbers in the country. Unemployment currently is around 11.2 million people that are unemployed. And if you listen to the president's uh, data relation address, he was talking about we've created around a million jobs. And some of those are not even jobs, jobs, they are work opportunity, which means that we really cannot talk about that program replacing income support for the majority of people um, in the country. So, so Treasury argues that the, the, the argument that focuses primarily on, <laughs> on income support uh, neglects the fact that people actually need to work and give them a sense of dignity and so on. Our argument would be, in fact, a sense of dignity, the fact that people don't have anything to eat is, is the most dehumanizing thing. It's more dehumanizing um, th 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 than to say that they should, they should rather be waiting for jobs that are just not there. Um, so we agree, of course, that there must be jobs that are created, that people should be put to work because 350 is not enough. Even if you are able to find the money and raise it to 624 or 633, which is the 663, which is the latest food poverty number, even if you could do that, you, you still would not be able really to give people a decent standard of living. That's just enough to buy the basics of food. What about transport? What about uh, time? What about other key things that people need? Um, electricity, access to energy, and so on. So, so the fact that women is it's not enough to, to, to say, let's look for jobs. It's also not enough to say, let's just do basic income. We need to have a combination of the two. And a combination of the two is what will lift people out of poverty by first giving them the basics of what you live on on a day to day basis. That certainty of, um, sorry, guys, I just. <laughs> sorry, thank you. Um, uh, uh, so so from this side, we did a second uh, round of research to try to say. It seems the argument that, I, that I was imagining is that SRG grants is a good base in which to build. So how do you build? What are the alternatives to build on that? And then they did a whole lot of work, tested the, the idea also of taking into account the argument around active level market policies and getting people to work. So, and also looking at what are the uh, inequality in, in impacts of introducing basically uh, this kind of income support. If you were to look at it from a provincial perspective, because of course, although nationally we know that we are the most unequal country in the world, we've overcome Brazil, which we should never have done. And because the things that they have done is not, have not been that monumental that we could not afford them, but because of policy divisions, we shouldn't do what the Brazilians did in order to actually build on their initial program. Um, but the fact of the matter is that we are it's important for us to say, let's still create the jobs. Let's still invest in them. Let's improve the way in which these programs are being run and co coordinate them better. But the SRG grant becomes a good foundation on which to consider that. So the work that was done by the panel was basically saying, um, based on the numbers that you've been able to, to cover, initially just 10.5 million uh, people at 10.9 actually at peak of the SRB plan, we have 10.9 people. Neil will never let me forget that because of changes that we made to the legislation and the regulations, we end up actually getting to about 50% of that in the next act, right? <laughs> the current one was busy with. As at December, I've got later number, I think as, as, as at end of January, our numbers are around 7.4. So despite all of the things we've tried to do, we still are not getting to the 10.5 million or 10.9 million people that should access the plan. The primary reason for that to our mind is the level at which we have set the threshold, the income threshold, and, and the fact that we, we, do, we do not have systems that can enable us to check whether the income that people have as we test them is, is from, we don't have a way of checking the sources. So any kind of inflow gets treated as your income and therefore um, you, will be, you, will be, you will be removed. So in some ways it actually goes against something that is, that, that is important to the culture of many South Africans, which is, I help my family, you know? So in some ways, those people who are helping their families might, might get their families to be penalized because we will look at them and say, you've got help. Therefore, we'll give to people who are earning much, much, we have none of that help. So, 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 so,
so so that's that's the policy dilemma that we face with <clears throat> means testing and how to actually make sure that you are you are equitable in the way that you're implementing it. And from a systems perspective, it's not possible to go and test every source of income and so on. But we, we are really worried that for us, the idea is that we should over time move then the threshold higher and higher so that you get to a point with, I mean, there's very few households where someone will give you a minimum wage every month, for example. So if we can think about increasing the, the threshold over time, that means we can, in that way, cover more and more, and more people and hopefully get to the point where we reach the sort of numbers that we think we need to reach, given that unemployment is at 11.2 million currently. And, and our numbers are, are very low compared to that number that we need to reach. So um, the panelists suggested that based on the analysis that they did, they did micro simulation and then CGE modeling and so on. What they have suggested, Chat suggested is, or what they found is firstly that if you implement the SRG grant by itself, actually you have, will have you will have positive um, economic and social impacts. Of course, we know this already from previous research, um, but also that um, even at, at national, at the, the impact at provincial at provincial level will differ based on based on the levels of inequality that they cited at, but it also has an impact on, on, on inequality to reduce inequality at provincial level by higher margins where the, the, the inequality is higher, obviously. Um, and then um, the other thing that they looked at us was whether you could do a wage, a wage subsidy instead for basic income support and what the impact of that is. The finding from that research is that actually the, the the wage subsidy has less impact. Is is the, the impact is positive still, but not not as high that the number the, the extent of inequality that it reduces, or even the levels to which it reduces poverty is much less than the SRG grant. And then the other thing that they tested was what happens if you combine those interests, you combine the uh, income support with wage subsidies. Obviously, the, the impact is a bit better with that combination, but of course, it relies quite a lot on the design of both the income support and the way in which the wage subsidy is designed and implemented. We know from experience that currently there is some, some wage subsidy that has this kind of a, um, what is it, um, employment tax incentive that Treasury fund. Yes. Okay, sure, I'm going to finish this. So, 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 so under those circumstances, not tested. We are worried that actually it resulted in, in job substitution rather than increasing the number of people that are employed and so on. So, so the key thing though is while it's important to do both, the income support should not compete with the wage subsidy proposal. Ideally, you want to have the, the, the income support as the base that continues and grows over time. You progressively increase the means test threshold and progressively increase the amount of money that you are giving to people over time. Um, different levels are proposed. So the food poverty line, obviously what we're giving now is too low. Either go, go to the food poverty line or the upper bound or lower bound poverty line, or even go all the way <clears throat> up to the, just below the uh, income tax threshold over time. Those are the proposals that are on the table. But from DSD side, we are working as, we need to start from the base, from the current system that we have and then increase it over time and also ensure that it gets extended for the, as long as we need for it to be extended while we're finalizing the legislation. This has been said in many, many platforms. So, so in, in summary then from, from, from our side, from, from DS, also look at the, from, from our perspective, we think that a basic income grant is a constitutional obligation and for as long as government does not commit to it, we are actually saying we don't, we are not committed to our own constitution. And we think that it's important to be put in place to address poverty uh, and, and not be made, to, and, and for people to actually see it as a right and not as, as, as a favor or a handout from government. That it should be seen rather as a hand up rather than a hand out. And also that um, we need to make sure that as we do the basic income support, we are also making sure that people are also linked to other economic and developmental opportunities so that they don't live only on that basic income because basic income is very basic. It's not sufficient for, for somebody to really thrive and achieve their best 
developmental objective of the country and of their self as an individual level. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I leave it back and I'll share the presentation. Thank you so much, Brenda. And um, we will ensure that your presentation circulated to the people listening on Zoom. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have time for questions at this stage, but we will have some time later in the symposium um, for audience questions and reflections. Um, but that was an incredibly comprehensive introduction to the challenges that DSD is facing and to the wider, um, wider debates around basic income. I'll now hand over to Dr. Vandu Zayn Vanda, who will introduce the next session um, and the, the next speaker. Thank you. Um, yes, my name is Van Dyer, and I is uh, Kelly already mentioned, and um, basically introducing the next session, which is on the macroeconomic impact of the universal of basic income grants, the strength and shortcomings of existing analysis and models. Brenda had already mentioned during a presentation that we tend to find uh, two sides: those who are supporting and those who are opposing the the UB, but sometimes it depends also on the methods that have been used. And also not all cases are the same. Therefore, if it doesn't work in one in one um, country or area, it doesn't mean it doesn't work in, in all areas. So it's also important for us to understand from other previous studies or other studies, what are the models saying? What are their weaknesses? What are their strengths? The analysis done also on the other countries, what, what do we learn from them? So this session is going to, we're going to have two um, speakers, Dr. Gilad Isaacs, who is going to have a recorded um, input on the macroeconomic methodologies. Just to quickly say something about um, Dr. Isaac, so of course, I'm not going to say everything, otherwise I'll spend the whole time talking about his, uh, his bio. He's a coordinator at the IEJ, and the IEJ who's co-hosting this workshop. He's also an economist working at FED and coordinates the National Minimum Wage Research Initiative. I'm just trying to talk about his background, which relates more to, to this work, as I said, not, not the whole CV. Then we will have a virtual a contribution from Dr. Stephen Kidd, who is with the Development Pathways, who is going to talk about the international experiences of the um, similar initiatives, that is the basic uh, income grant. Dr. Kidd's he has more than 30 years experience on social security and social development in more than 25 countries, which include countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Latin America, in Asia, and in the Caribbean and Pacific. So you can see that both of them have uh, quite wide experience and we can't wait, personally, I can't wait to hear what they are going to share um, with us from their knowledge. Thank you. Doctor. They have not located the recording from Villa Dazen, so perhaps we should just start with Dr. Kidd. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, can you say it again? We will move the program a bit. We'll start now with uh, Dr. Kip's presentation, then we'll do Dr. Isaac's uh, recorded contribution as the there second is. one. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, I think I heard what you um, were saying. So can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Um, well, uh, welcome from the um, hello from the UK. Uh, it's uh, good morning to everyone. It's a pleasure to be asked to speak at uh, this workshop. Um, let me just share my slides, and we can get into the um, into the presentation. So hopefully, everything is up then that you can see it. So. What I was going to talk around was the was broadly around the impacts of economic growth and investing in universal social security. A lot of the research that we've done is not on um, specifically on on universal basic income, but is on universal benefits more generally across the the, the life cycle. But I think a lot of the uh, lessons are very um, similar. And um, so, what we have developed. Um, is a is a kind of model, a conceptual model of how social security, particularly so universal social security, impacts on economic growth. And that it has a range of impacts. Some are, are much more immediate. Some are medium term. Some are long term. As uh, we've identified, around uh, eleven sort of uh, pathways through which investing in social security can dr help drive economic growth. And of course, it's no coincidence that some of the most prosperous. Um, countries in the world have very significant investments in um, uh, universal social security, I think. Uh, and uh, we we can sort of learn a lot from, from those experiences of, of, of how investing in significant, significantly in universal social security can help deliver strong economic growth and sustainable economic growth, importantly, in countries. Now, I don't have time to go through all of these impacts because we have a very short uh, session. I just wanted to focus on on three very um very uh quickly the the latter part we'll be looking at some um uh, analysis we've done using um computable um general equilibrium models um globally to, to look at the impacts on on economic growth um so look beginning first to look at one of the um longer term impacts which i think is really important i'll just go through very briefly because i'm sure you know you know it all very well is around how investing in universal social security and strengthen human capital by giving the stronger health and education outcomes um, uh, among children and therefore the future um, workforce to, to deliver a, a more skilled workforce to the country. And essentially, I think, you know, governments often make the mistake, they invest in education and schooling and invest in, invest in, in health services for supporting um, um, child development, which is really, really important. But often forget about investing sufficiently in social security, ensuring that families themselves have sufficient income to be able to support the investments that government is also putting into the schools and and uh, and health services. And that it's investing in all three sufficiently is how we're going to get a skilled workforce by delivering good uh, health and nutritional education outcomes amongst children. So I'm sure you 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 know this if you look at this graph. You know that the impacts of of, of uh, ensuring good nutrition for um for for young children if you look at the the red line you can see the increase in brain growth that uh, most of it comes in the preschool period therefore it's really important to ensure good nutrition for children um in the preschool period 
then the blue line is showing the sort of rates of return that we get from investing in 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 in, in both children and 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 adults and you can see the highest investment that we get the rates of return are from preschool interventions um uh, in terms of um so giving support to children but that these also need to continue throughout school to ensure that um kids that we take advantage of the of the of the investments in in the very early years so there's been global research that has shown that if children experience stunting during their first few years the lifetime earnings can fall by as much as 26 percent because of lower skills showing the importance of, of these very early interventions and of course south africa has the the child support grant and there's, as you'll know, there's been evidence of where if you receive the old age and child support grant in, in South Africa, you're likely to be a child that's likely to be three to five centimeters taller and that the child support grant um, received at an early age, you, you'll perform better at maths and reading, which does suggest some um, impacts that it's having on cognitive development. Of course, important to bear in mind that we still have a means tested child support grant, which means that 20 percent of the poorest children are missing out on the child support grant in, in South Africa. So by not making the child support grant universal, then you're losing out on investing in a, in a significant uh, proportion of, of, of children across the country. But it's not just about the, as I said, about nutrition and the early years. It's about also supporting kids as they get through school. If the parents have a secure income, then kids will be better able to concentrate in class if they're not hungry and have good nutrition. Um, at school, and of course, this can be complemented by um, 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 school meals programs for, for kids at school. But it's really important to remember that the home environment is absolutely critical for investing in, in, in child well-being. There's a study shown that 86% of the variation in education attainment is down to differences in the home environment, not schools. It's really about the differences in the home environment. Much of that is down to the level of income that parents have is where universal basic income can 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 really ha help so that, you know, for example, children can have more games and books, which will help stimulate their um, their cognitive development. Parents can spend more time with their children, um, which uh, is, is critically important for their development. And there'll be less violence and stress in the family, which uh, where we have high levels of domestic violence or domestic uh, abuse in families that has a real negative impact on child development. The second area I want to go into quickly is, and I think you've, you've really been alluding to this um, already, is the, the increased investment in productive activities that we can get from investing in the population and giving them a basic, secure guarantee of an income um, going, going forward. When we don't have this, we don't have um, access to social security for the working age population, uh, then you know the, the 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 people are often living, particularly those in the informal and subsistence sectors, or living from day to day. They can't plan for the future. And they're much less likely to invest in productive activities. They're fearful of taking risks, and taking risks is really important to be able to invest in small businesses, small enterprises, and other income generating activities. However, with social security, when people have this guarantee of an income and they know that month to month they will have a minimum income absolutely certain they know that they can put uh, food on the table for the family cover their basic costs then they're able to take a longer term view and begin to think about uh investments in more productive activities and taking more risks and more risks are likely to be higher returns and ultimately be more and more families be in a better position to feed their families and this will feed through into broader economic growth and putting in place this foundation through universal social security is critically important if you can just think about investing in 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 uh families as as as, as like a house building a house that you can invest in the house is the economic activities economic investments that uh, um, people can can um engage in you know that's the 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 house but it needs any house needs a secure foundation and social protection and social security is the foundation of economic engagement. This gives the, the absolute security for people to be certain that they can invest. And if you take away the foundation, as would happen with houses, if without secure foundations, they'll collapse. And that's what we see often when people don't have this security, they invest, the, the, the investment goes badly wrong, and then 
they 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 lose everything and therefore people are much less willing to take this and there's lots of evidence globally of providing this income security is critically important to uh helping people invest i think you i just heard there was already a, a sort of discussion around though the important whether it's a means tested or universal basic income i think what we have to remember that the cat giving people cash them, it's themselves on a regular basis doesn't make people lazy we know that that people will use it well uh, particularly if it's below the level that uh, um, you can uh, have a good life with. But we also know that if you means test benefits, then you create perverse incentives. You encourage people to remain poor, to remain out of the labor force due to the um, high rates of marginal taxation that people experience. This is a problem that has affected high income countries, which use means testing. Um, but it's also studies here, and I don't have time to get into them here. You can see it on, this, on the slides later. There are three studies that have shown in Argentina, Uruguay, and Georgia through means testing benefits um, for families. And I think the TSA in Georgia is very similar to the basic income grant, means tested basic income grant that you're talking about in, in South Africa. It does lead to people being much less likely to be economically active because it doesn't make sense to work if you're going to lose a large amount of the, the benefit. It's a big problem that we have in the UK, where we have a similar sort of program, our universal credit, which is a means-tested program, despite the name, has a marginal rate of taxation of 67%, and few people are willing to work for a tax rate of 67%. So this is a critically important um, um, issue that you need to bear in mind. We're making a choice between a means test and a universal um, um, basic income grant is, are you going to create these perverse incentives that actually discourage people from engaging in the labor market? And then lastly, I want to talk about what I think is the, the, the main interest is the kind of impacts you get from just injecting more cash into the economies. By putting cash into the economy to drive demand, drive more spending, build markets, um, it's, it's a critically important um, 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 secondary benefit of, of universal social security. We've seen during the response of governments in, uh, to COVID-19 across the world, particularly in high income countries, the massive amounts of cash that they've been putting into the hands of people to get them to spend and generate more economic growth. And this has really helped bring around strong economic growth and recovery from uh, the COVID-19. Now, as I think you've already alluded to, and I think a similar study has been done, if you look at this really, the type of taxation that you use has a very significant impact on the extent to which investing in universal social security will deliver um, economic growth. This is a study that we did using um, CG modeling for, for India, where you can see different types of tax. One in green is sales tax, and the orange and blue are uh, capital tax or progressive income tax. And whilst the capital tax and progressive income tax deliver positive economic growth, using VAT or a sales tax actually undermines economic growth. So I think, as, as you already understand, in South Africa, and I think was mentioned by the previous speaker, using a sales tax to deliver a basic income grant doesn't make sense because it might have negative economic impacts. Now, studies that we've done in many countries, and it's just three here that I'll, I'll give, sort of Rwanda, Bangladesh, and India, have shown that by investing 1% of GDP in social security through a more progressive tax system can deliver economic growth. This shows the increases each year from the beginning of the policy implementation in each year, not the cumulative increases um, on economic growth. And you can see that they range between 0.4% of GDP to, to after 10 years in India, 1% of GDP, almost getting back this in economic growth, what you're delivering in um, the, the, the additional cash that you're putting into people's hands from social security. I think though these models are very sensitive in, in many ways. I think the following speaker was meant to be the first speaker, um, you know, will probably explain this a, a, a bit better. A lot of it depends on the assumptions. So often a progressive income tax, the sensitivity of the results will depend on the assumptions you have about what would happen if you didn't tax the rich with a progressive income tax. Are they just going to put that money into savings or send it overseas, which doesn't help the economy? Or are you assuming they would have spent it anyway? And this can change very much the results that you get in terms of the level of uh, impacts. But I think it's globally accepted, as we see by many high income countries, 
that investing in a large amount of social security will help drive your economy and help um, recover from economic problems now, um, economic challenges and recessions that countries have. I just wanted to give some results that we haven't published yet, which are just coming out, just looking at a, a couple of countries, but looking at the cumulative impacts. We've recently simulated impacts of a universal child benefit in Kenya, it's similar to the, the child support grant, but I think it has the base, same basic uh, principle of a, of a universal benefit where we costed it starting children nine years of age and keeping them on the benefit, um, but maintaining the, 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 the value of the benefit um, index to, to inflation. So it reaches around 1% of GDP, the total investment. And this is the kind of impact that we found from different types of prog more progressive taxes, uh, income taxes in, in orange and corporation tax in yellow and a mix in green. And you can see the cumulative impacts that after 20 years, we predicted that economy would be 8% larger through this investment. And of course, we have many of the other benefits that we that we get that haven't been taken into account in this economic growth, the investments in, in human capital, et cetera, which would come well after 20 years of investing in, um, in, in, in families. And it also drives higher employment uh, uh, as well, the simulations that we did showed that after 20 years, we'd expect employment to be 3% um, higher in, in Kenya. We did a similar um, anal analysis in Sri Lanka of universal benefits, similar to the, um, to what you have in South Africa, but made universal on old age disability and child benefits at a cost of about 1.2% of GDP, increasing gradually as the programs expand to 20 to 2038 to, to about 1.7 percent of GDP and then the cumulative impacts on um, economic growth we found through the analysis would be likely after 20 years the economy would be about six percent larger through um, the the use of um, um, corporation um, tax where it had a in, in Sri Lanka corporation tax had a higher impact than progressive income taxes both being um, um, progressive, and you can see the 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 green is is the middle. So still a very significant impact on economic growth. On top of all the bigger impacts that you get from investing in in families, not least a sense of dignity and and well being, but also these these um, abilities to to invest invest in children, and the many other impacts that I didn't have time to go through that we've identified as the pathways to economic growth. Again, in Sri Lanka, we found impacts on employment that after 20 years employment would be around 2% higher as a result of investing in, in social security. Just looking at some real world examples of studies that have been done elsewhere. There's a study done in the United States looking at the, um, after the first global economic crisis, financial crisis in 2009, in investments that the United States did in different programs. Those in orange are investments in social security programs. And those in blue are investments in infrastructure, defense, and, and general aid that they gave to state governments. And you can see in terms of the multipliers, what did you get for every dollar that was invested in the, the uh, economy in the United States as to help economic recovery? And you can see that the um, investments in social security had bigger impacts than investments in infrastructure and, and other areas. We found this in many other results el el elsewhere. Um, and had multipliers of about every for every dollar you got around 1.6 dollars back in terms of greater um, economic activity. And there was a World Bank study that looked uh, in in a in over 30 countries between 1984 and 2013 on different investments uh, by governments in different areas um, from economic affairs, general public services, defense, health, education, social protection or social security and, and uh, total public spending. And you can see that the greatest impacts th that they found, the functional mul multipliers on, on GDP were greatest from investing in social security. This is just looking backwards over about 30 years of investment in in these um, countries. So we can see we can get a big bang for the buck from investing in social security, by all the other benefits that we can get, then still, we still will generate greater economic growth. It's not gonna be a threat to the economy as long as we get the tax system right in terms of uh, how, we, how we invest. Just then, to a couple of slides to, to, to finish off. 
I think looking at the question of can South Africa afford to do this, I think it's important to look at uh, how much other high income countries that South Africa will aspire towards, how much they are currently investing in social security. And you can see here for a range of high income countries are investing on average around 12% of GDP in different forms of social, um, social security, whereas South Africa at the moment is still just investing around 4% of GDP if you, can include, if you count the social grants and the unemployment insurance that, that, that is there. So still a long way to go to reach the levels of investment in many of these highly successful economies that have driven their success since the Second World War, largely through massive expansion often largely in, 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 in many countries in universal social security. And just finally, I think this whole question around, you know, um, whether we should have universal or, 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 or uh, means tested um, um, support to, to families. We've done analysis in, in, in a range of countries to look at the relationship between investing in social security, universal social security schemes and the tax that is spent and looked at different families and the uh, and the extent to which consumption in families is increased or decreased when we take into account both the tax they pay and the spending. So this is just an example of India where we looked at just uh, investment in universal transfers of 2% of GDP. And you can see the orange line at the uh, that we have across the middle at 0%, that's the where there is no change in, in, in household consumption. And the blue line that goes um, from the top left down to the bottom right is the change in, in consumption as a result of the, the amount that families receive from universal benefits and the amount they pay through a slightly progressive tax system. And as you can see, at around the 70th percentile, we see that the line crosses over so that those to the left are the net winners from the, from the universal uh, transfers when you take into account the, the tax they're paying and the transfers they're receiving. Um, and the biggest winners are those who are on the very lowest incomes, who, who in this simulation had very significant increases in consumption from the universal benefits. And the net losers are those in the top 30% um, who are the biggest financial losers. So we're almost simulating a kind of good form, form of targeting through universal benefits when we take into account the, the tax in that ultimately those that are better off will redistribute some of their wealth to the majority of the population at the left, uh, or, or, to, the, to, to, to the majority of the population in the poorest 70%. 70, 70%. So we have good redistribution, significant impacts on, on inequality as a, as a result of doing this. But importantly, I think this is the, the key thing of, for the political economy of investing in, in, in in, in transfers is that by making them universal and ensuring that the better off receive the transfers, they support them politically and therefore are willing for their taxes to be to to be paid to deliver on that. And I think I heard this mentioned earlier around people saying, well, we've got high rates of tax, people will leave the country because they don't want to pay. That's not borne out by history. The highest rates of tax globally are paid in countries like the Nordic countries, which are countries where people don't want to leave. The rich don't want to leave the Nordic countries. Why? Because by paying a high amount of tax, they're receiving high quality public services. And they have much more peaceful societies, strong levels of social cohesion, and they don't want to leave the rich. They don't want to leave. They want to stay living in those countries despite the high taxes, because in return for high taxes, the better off also receive high quality public services and no longer have to pay that out of their own pockets. So I'll just finish there and I hope that was a uh, useful um, uh, uh, input into your into your debate, which I'd follow with uh, great interest. Apologies, Kelly, you're on mute. Uh, is the room on mute? Okay. I can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Okay. I was just saying thank you so much, Dr. Kidd, for that um, very important input. It will be very useful for framing our discussion this afternoon. And I think that it is quite interesting to reflect on the uh, the global perspective 
and the possibility that South Africa has an opportunity to be a leader in terms of implementing evidence-based um, social protection. Um, we have quite a tight schedule today, but I would like to have an opportunity for audience questions for um, Stephen and Brenda. So please could I encourage everybody listening online, if you do have questions, to post them in the Q&A. We will try to um, take some questions at the end of this section. Uh, we'll now move on to input from Dr. Gilad Isaacs, who um, cannot be here in person. He's currently in India, but he has kindly recorded his input. Uh, and I'll hand it over to Moses. Are we ready to play the recording? Okay, wonderful. Sorry, for everybody online, we're just trying to make sure that you can hear Gilad. Just bear with us one moment. What we may expect to find um, and what other uh, evidence um, shows. Um, and I do have a PowerPoint that I'm going to Good morning, everyone, um, and apologies that I'm not there with you in person. Um, as you might see from behind me, I'm actually away. I'm uh, recording this from India. Um, uh, and um, yeah, it was very um, unfortunate timing. Um, but really great to be able to make this input to this important uh, event uh, thanks to the uh, HSRC and IJ. You know, it doesn't have some bolt in the laptops. Questions for um, Dr. Kidd. For anybody online, please feel free to post questions. Um, just while we sort out these technical difficulties, we, we can have a Q&A discussion. Yeah, I've got a very simple question, Dr. Kit. Uh, uh, can you make the slides available? And uh, are there sort of more detailed, um, you know, uh, is there more detailed work? So, for example, you, you said very interesting things about the World Bank uh, assessment of the impact of uh, that was actually Brenda, but but your 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 the multipliers on social security versus infrastructure and other forms of investment. If you could talk to that a little bit more. Um, um, yeah, um, we can 
certainly I'll, I'll I was I was just about to send the slides over to the to the organizers so you, so you can have those and I think we've we've written up a couple of papers with the International Trade Union Congress where we've shown some of the analysis that we've done and then I think some of the more recent analysis I was put in there for Kenya and Sri Lanka or on or on um, reports um, that are about to be published in, both in Kenya and, and Sri Lanka the one in Kenya is much more comprehensive it's where we've developed the, the the this kind of a model on the very on the many different pathways of of linking um social protection to to economic growth um i think the the impacts on um i think the 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 you know the the comparison with uh you know sort of infrastructure spending and other, uh, and other spending i think it's uh largely driven through through the sort of um you know, more large managers driven through the sort of wages that are going on to infrastructure investment, as well as the impacts of the broader infrastructure investment in the types of models in the, the that are used through the in the social accounting matrix model, um, and uh, uh, and and working it through the many different pathways in 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 the economy. So I think the the details on on that, I think you'll have to look at the the papers. I wasn't the person who did the the analysis and I think the pathways through that you you'll have to to see but I think it's not saying that we should invest in social security and not uh, infrastructure one economic growth of course we need to invest in infrastructure we need to invest in health we need to invest in education but the message that we're trying to that the analysis I think is is showing is that people don't think that investing in regular um, cash benefits for um um people on a on a universal basis will really have any impacts on economic growth and i think there's a lot of the analysis globally is showing that it does have a very very significant impact and it goes back to to my point if high income countries are spending on average 12 percent of gdp and have developed very very successful economies for a range of different uh um reasons and we do go through a lot of different other pathways in which this 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 occurs then i think um it shows the case that you know if you want strong economic growth, then you also still have to invest in, in uh, sufficiently in social security as well as in other areas of investment. You can just use your top straight rows. Okay, so for us, or me, my, my, my question, like, uh, we, so you were highlighting the time frames, 20, 20 years or something. But now, our, the tick, uh, in, the, in our uh, courtyard, uh, time is ticking to the, the National Development Plan, of course, allocated by Brenda to, to yeah, the commitments of the S, SDGs. Yeah, it's, I believe it's only seven years to meet the, the, the SDGs and the, 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 the national development targets. So, as we, we inquiry, we want to ask if now are we going to let it to the, for also the kids who are uh, currently, can we also estimate the kids who are born, uh, are born out of our, how much depth each, each, each kid is born out of? Yeah, just a, a General statement. The, also, the political will. Also, we are the political. We saw the ANC open the threshold of the political funding. But now, could we say our, our political will is also uh, letting us down if we are not using the tools that are afforded us for 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 the national development, the national in development bank, yeah, the development bank, the BRICS development bank, because now it seems like. Most of the tools are wasted uh, to the war of, 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 of Ukraine, yeah, and the inflation, and the things keep rising due to the war. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. No, I, th I think the question where we're looking at um, sort of projections 20 years in the future, I think what we were saying in the, in, in the model is by one, by injecting cash into the economy, that's what countries have been doing to get out of the, the COVID crisis, that we're doing and um, getting out of the 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 crisis in 2009 2010 there were large investments uh, in in spending um and giving people cash to create markets 
uh, in the economy, and that has an immediate impact on 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 economic growth. But I think we'd argue that you know in high income countries and many other countries, and and probably also in South Africa, where studies were done, the injection of cash that you're getting from social security on a regular basis through this redistribution is taking cash often from the rich who might send it overseas or put it into savings, et cetera, redistributing it into spending, often in the local economy uh, and in, 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 in locally produced goods and helping generate therefore more employment and more um, economic growth in the short term, which then builds up over time and accumulates over time so that your long-term trajectory is gonna be significantly higher in terms of economic growth by doing these investments um now and increasing on those investments but when you talk about the sdgs etc of course the impacts you can get are going to be um you know much more significant uh, uh, as well on many of the the sdgs in terms of on the more immediate level through this redistribution in terms of tackling inequality getting people out of income poverty investing in in, in uh you know um reduced stunting etc is going to come you know, in the medium term, in the next few years, by investing in 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 children and supporting families to look after their their children. So partially, the support is coming from the child support grant. Often, the support in South Africa comes from the old age pension or the disability benefits. But I think what you've seen is that you're missing out. That that's not enough. The working age population also needs um, additional support. This minimum platform that they can invest in their families immediately, which will then help them themselves not only invest in income generating activities, but also go be able to better access um, employment, but you're creating more opportunities for employment by putting more cash into the, into the, um, uh, into the markets and gro growing your markets, which will then create more, more jobs. So, you know, you should find that entrepreneurs will benefit, will, will, should be some of the biggest advocates of a universal basic income because they're going to benefit from a much greater market um, um, themselves. And I think in terms of the political will, I think it's important to remember that means-tested benefits globally have very little political will behind them. They have very little investment because um, the, the, those better off are asked to still pay their taxes, but don't receive the benefit, which reduces their support for those programs. Universal benefits, which are received by those at the top, they feel as if they are also receiving something, and therefore they're much willing to pay their much more willing to pay their taxes. Ministries of Finance are much more willing to increase to to invest in their budgets, and you generate a much stronger political will through um, through universal benefits. Means tested benefits tend to be small, poor quality, and tend to um, shrink over time. So I think it's a it's a fundamental question, but I would think you know you do need to look at this in terms of programs like the child support grant making it fully universal would be a first step in actually ensuring that every child receives support as well as moving on to you know investing in in basic income i thought our, our difficulties with the recording but we have a scheduled tea break now so why don't we have a 10 minute tea break when we come back we'll hear um from gillard's presentation and then we will move on to um presenting the results of Asgard's modeling. So uh, we'll resume at five past 11 to give everyone a chance to have a cup of coffee. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. So um, we've managed to sort out the technical problems and we can now play the recording of Dr. Gillard Isaac's presentation. Um, Gillette's going to take us through some of the existing modeling approaches to the macroeconomics of UBIG in South Africa and talk about some of the strengths and, and some of the weaknesses of the existing approaches that are out there. So we'll hear from Gillette now and then we'll move on to uh, presenting the original research. economic impact of a basic income. The first is to unpack a little bit of what macro... Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm sorry that I'm not there in person, but thanks to the IJ and HSRC teams for organizing this important uh, event. 
Um, I'd like to speak to you today about three things um, to uh, introduce uh, the um, theme of macroeconomic modeling and the macroeconomic impact of a basic income. The first is to unpack a little bit of what macroeconomic modeling is and what various model types there are and some pros and cons. The second um, is to look at the existing evidence of these uh, models and basic income. And the third is to ask how we should be thinking um, uh, about uh, viewing modeling results uh, in this light. So as shown in this picture, what a macroeconomic model attempts to do is uh, uh, simulate and provide projections on a composite and complex picture of the economy as a whole. Um, these models have been integral to macroeconomic policy making. They're used widely by um, economic policy um, institutions, uh, and they're built on top of what's called a social accounting matrix, essentially a understanding of the economic indicators and variables uh, within a economy. There's various types of macroeconomic models. Um, in particular for today, there's two key families which are relevant. The first is general equilibrium models, um, uh, which are main, which are used by treasuries, central banks, uh, and elsewhere, and macroeconometric models, which are used uh, less commonly, although I will argue um, have various strengths. Um, and this macroeconometric model is the type which ADRS and ASGAR, who we'll hear from soon, makes use of. In addition to the types of models, and those have quite profound implications for the uh, nature of the output, actually, which I'll return to, um, there's also really important to realize that there's different theories and assumptions which are being made um, in these models based on different economic thought. Uh, the general equilibrium models tend to, to be uh, neoclassical, um, uh, so more dominated by the supply side and and price impacts and the latter more mixed or Keynesian or post-Keynesian. Uh, I'm going to unpack some of those implications um, in a minute. So just an example of macroeconomic models in general. Um, let's take the idea of altering a particular variable, let's say wages. So you increase wages, that might increase business costs, it might also raise the spending power of wage earners. Um, uh, increased business costs might lead to a fall in demand, but uh, increased spending of wage earners could lead to an uh, increase in demand. These effects might shift the balance of imports and exports, all of this might impact employment levels, and so on. So you can see how by shifting one uh, variable in the e economy, uh, you end up uh, having a r ripple effect through the economy. And in order to simulate this, uh, what we do is build a series of interacting equations. So X variable impacts on Y variable, and um, these equations interrelate with um, each other. And that's how the model is built. Um, so you need to decide what variables impact what is wages going to impact incomes, for instance, okay, is social tra transfers through like a basic income going to impact on a low income earners income, right, but you also need to decide um, how much these things impact each other, uh, what parameters, what elasticities you um, include, that's similar to the idea of a multiplier, um, that one rand spent on uh, on social grants leads to a 1.2 uh, per percent increase in household income uh, be because of multiple grants recipients or whatever. Um, uh, you then shock or alter a particular variable in the e economy, and that ripples through the rest of the economy. So, I mean, that's just a general background for how macroeconomic models uh, work. And of course, throughout this, I'm somewhat simplifying. Um, so uh, for the experts in the room, uh, if you could bear that in mind. 
So when we want to look at a model and the model tells us, right, which we're going to see uh, that you have a basic income at X level and that leads to either these positive outcomes, those negative outcomes or some mix um, uh, in between. How is it that we should think um, about these, right, and evaluate uh, them? Well, the first is that you can interrogate the designs and the specifications, right? What do those equations actually look like? The second is you can compare how close uh, uh, the um, model itself and the output which the, the model gives you um, to real world events. Now, um, I will, will argue that the neoclassical general equilibrium models, which in South Africa have so far been used to model a basic in income, uh, perform poorly um, on both of these uh, 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 criteria, okay? Um, and that they don't uh, really reflect um, how the real world works. Sorry, excuse me here. Um, and I want to give you an example um, uh, uh, of that. Um, so, for instance, we saw the use of general equilibrium models in the potential imp implementation of a national minimum wage about eight years ago, six years ago now. And um, the National Treasury uh, did a modeling um, which showed that a national minimum wage of 1,268 rand would lead to 96,000 job losses, okay? So that's a really low level. We implemented a level almost three times that. Um, and as they modeled larger wage uh, levels, so the impact was more and more negative. Now, we know both from the South Africa, but we know from a huge range of international uh, studies that the impact of minimum wages on employment is neutral, negligible, sometimes slightly small, um, and at times positive. That's the absolutely ex ex accepted academic consensus about what happens when you Im implement or increase minimum wa wages. And yet these models produce uh, much more uh, negative outcomes than we actually see in the real world. And that's got to do with the fact that they are built in a particular way. Um, and those models are built at, in such a way uh, that the, um, the the supplier side, the, the prices in the economy dominate. Um, so when the uh, 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 price of labor increases, um, it has a range of the negative Im impacts. But that's just one uh, uh, element. Um, and I, I want to speak about another assumption school, which neoclassical uh, models uh, often make because this has a direct bearing on basic income. Just to say the reason I use the example of a national minimum wage is because unfortunately we don't have the same level of evidence on basic in income. It hasn't been Im implemented to the same scale and therefore it's harder to compare uh, model results with um, uh, a in in entire e um, the impact of a economy-wide basic income. Although they have been more targeted uh, research. The other important assumptions, and there's are obviously uh, many, um, which neoclassical uh, models make and which we find in the uh, general equilibrium ones, are that uh, the investment in the economy is limited by a pre-existing pool of existing savings. And this is important because um, the argument goes that if you have a limited pool of money available in, in the economy, and it, if government um, absorbs too large a share of that, then you'll see a reduced level of investment in the economy by the private sector. Um, and this is, is a fundamentally false proposition, right? Um, as the Bank of England uh, noted a decade ago, um, uh, most investment is spurred by 
bank lending and bank lending isn't limited by some fixed pool of uh, savings in the economy. But it's important because if you assume that, then if government borrows more or um, and spends more, it means less money for in investment by the private sector. So I'm, I'm trying to illustrate to you how the assumptions which you make and the way in which that model is built um, really determines fundamentally the nature of the output um, which you will uh, receive. Um, okay, so th th that gives a sense of the of the modeling and, and some of the complexities. As I said, we don't have a economy wide basic in income in many countries, if any, in its universal um, form. Um, so let's look first at some of the modeling evidence, and then let's look at some of the real world microeconomic evidence. So there have been a range of modeling outputs which do show um, a favorable uh, um, uh, 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 outcomes, right? There are also a range of those um, which show negative outcomes. I've decided to focus those within the South Africa um, explanation. Um, but we see there, for instance, that um, the uh, development pathways, which we'll hear from shortly, um, you know, showed that a, a percent in, in, increase in social protection leads to multiplier effects both in GDP and on government revenue, okay? Um, we see uh, studies from the US and um, elsewhere. And generally we see that uh, fund, when it's when a basic income is funded through progressive taxation, there is a better economic stimulus. Uh, recently, there's been some modeling done from the CGE uh, and DSGE uh, models, those general equilibrium uh, models. Um, uh, and um, these mirror the findings internationally of these models also. Um, Steenkamp uh, and 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 co-authors find, for instance, that the SRD grant uh, is viable with tax in increases. But as soon as um, there is a more widespread basic income, it threatens debt and it crowds out consumption and in investment. Now that directly reflects what I was referring to earlier. That actually that has to happen because that's the assumption made in that model in the first place uh, that this type of government spending will have that crowding out um, effect in a more sophisticated model alex van der Heerwe and team find a, a range of uh, scenarios um, of the srd grant which show uh, positive um, outcomes so it really depends on the nature of the model plus the design um, uh, uh, of the uh, scenarios themselves. So, you know, well, that leaves us unsure of, you know, what to believe and are these models worth it or, or aren't they? And, and so it is important to try and match the modeling output or compare it to what we do know about what has ha happened else, elsewhere and what occurs in the real world. Now we know that uh, in South Africa and a uh, DPRU research paper showed this recently that cash transfers are the most direct and effective mechanism for reducing income poverty. We know also that income poverty is a barrier to entering the labor market. Uh, we, we know from international evidence that cash transfers consistently improve health outcomes. We see that in research in South Africa and India, Namibia, Alaska, um, on mental health uh, in Kenya, in a 45 country uh, study. Uh, we know that universal income supports women's independence and autonomy uh, from a study in India, for, for instance. We know that it su supports the social cohesion and a fall in crime from uh, evidence in Uganda, Tanzania and so on. And we've seen that there is a 
local multiplier um, effect where it stimulates economic activity again in Ghana, in Kenya, in South Africa, um, uh, and, and elsewhere. And all of this evidence is detailed in a research paper by Dr. Kelly Horson and Zimbabwe Mube um, uh, for the uh, uh, ES, uh, sorry, ERSA, -E ERSA, um, uh, uh, and is available on them and on the IJ's websites. Okay, so we should, and this is where I'll leave things, we should expect that the modeling output um, uh, uh, is going to somewhat match what we observe in the, the, the real world. There's also a range of things which we know about basic income, uh, uh, which we should expect to reflect in the um, modeling output, which is that um, it shifts spending from high to low income earners, um, that it uh, spurs the, the demand for local goods, that it has low leakage so that um, those funds reach the intended uh, recipients, even though some are uh, excluded um, un unfairly, that it stimulates local e economic activities. It is leveraged um, to start micro enterprises. It has benefits in health and education. It uh, increases equity and lowers poverty, and that's good for e economic growth and so on. And so, you know, we should expect to see in modeling, you know, not only these outcomes, uh, we should also expect that there, you know, um, uh, uh, that that there is a possibility of um, uh, the um, in a basic income being unaffordable or having adverse effects. And, and that's why we model various um, so scenarios. Um, uh, but we should expect to see uh, some of these multiplier effects um, in the modeling output. So ultimately, um, one needs to uh, uh, look to see how well the model is built, how realistic the assumptions are, um, and also how well it matches real world outcomes. And it's for that reason why the IEJs worked with ADRS. Um, of course, they aren't like the the only ones, but you know, for a, a South African specific like model, uh, they have a macroeconometric model which integrates the economy in a comprehensive way um, and is well able to see the nuanced effects of both positive and negative um, impact of a basic income in a way which makes sense um, in terms of the existing local and, in, and in international evidence. Thanks very much. The next session will be brought to the chair by Colin HSMC. So I will step out of the hot seat. Um, <laughs> see you soon, guys. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and everyone joining us virtually. Um, so our next session is a presentation of new modeling of pathways to being in South Africa. And this is based on original research conducted by the Applied Development Research Solution in partnership with the Institute for Economic Justice. So this research um, provides insights into funding pathways uh, to achieving uh, universal a basic income grant, and it also looks at the fiscal implications. So our first speaker, or our first presenter is Shrestha Zimbali Mube, who is a social activist, a social justice activist, and researcher at the Institute for Economic Justice. And his presentation will focus on pathways to uh, universal basic income grant, and he will um, give us an overview of three scenarios that have been modeled. Um, our second speaker will be Dr. Asghar 
at Delta Day, who is a director and chief economic modeler at Applied Development Research Solutions. And he was also the report lead author, um, and he will present on results of modeling macroeconomic impacts of alternative pathways to UBIC. So I'll hand over now to our first presenter, Mr. Zimbali Nube. Okay. Did you want to say I hope that it's fine? Yes. Yeah, it should be. Good morning, everyone. As said, I'm Zimbali UK. And uh, I'm just going to be very brief. Basically, my presentation is going to lay the foundation to um, what is to come in terms of the results from ASGA. Just think, just going over the, the actual uh, pathways that we discussed, uh, which have you know, then factored in it into the modeling. Um, and I want to just preface that to say that we, uh, some of you will remember from civil society, we had a meeting as the IEJ and other partners with the president. And this is where we presented some of the initial uh, pathways which we felt were important uh, in the um, implementation of the universal basic income grant. And so this is the work that continues to develop at the back of that discussion. Like, so I'll just be speaking to some of the pathways that we uh, have discussed into the into the, into the morning. Um, we basically have three key pathways. So that is a low basic, a low ambition basic income grant, a medium ambition uh, scenario, and a high ambition pathway. And so the key difference is the. To, to take into account is that we start at this low base um, because uh, we, we're trying to, as, as was already said, uh, touched on by Kidat, to also reflect um, real world uh, 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 realities, right? And so this scenario is at a low value. Um, it's the means test is quite lower than the other scenarios. And we, Although we're progressing to a, a U big, we do so at a very slow pace. And then when you compare this with the medium ambition, it starts at the, at the higher uh, value, uh, with a means test that is much higher. And then we start to integrate our uh, progressive financing uh, at an earlier stage as we proceed. And then lastly, we have the high ambition scenario, which again starts at a, um, the value of the grant is much higher and we, uh, progress towards universality much earlier in the pathway. So basically the modeling assumes that the basic income grant will be implemented as from 2023 and will be progressively increased in line with the national food poverty line, our national poverty line rather. And we've, like I've said, I've spoken to the different um, categories and through the modeling that um, ASGA will be taking us through from NDRS, we'll be testing the impact of the pathways on the different uh, number of macroeconomic indicators. And I think the key things to take into account are uh, when looking at this, these results that ASGA will present, but also the pathways um, which some of our speakers have touched on already is the design of the grant. And this involves whether the grant is targeted, um, that is through a means test or whether it's universal. And you'll see that um, 
and the pathways we, like I said, we use the National Poverty, food poverty Lines. I don't know why I keep saying food. Uh, the National Poverty Lines are used as the mean test uh, threshold. And then in terms of the values of the grant, um, the, the pathways basically start from uh, 2023 up until 2030. Um, and the monthly values of the grant uh, increase uh, annually by 5%. Um, and this is, to, this is in line with the historical uh, uh, average of the national food poverty lines. Asga will go into detail as to how exactly did we factor in that, that annual increase. And then lastly, it's the financing. Um, and that is to say the grant is financed to uh, a new social security tax um, and the world tax. And these taxes are levied at different uh, levels in the scenarios. We, as you'll see, we, we introduce them at different uh, uh, points in the, in the pathway. And so this is a. Uh, yeah, it's just taking a while to, oh, okay. <laughs> to adjust. Yeah, I think it will catch up. Okay. <laughs> um, but basically, uh, as you'll see, the next slide is just a, a more detail around uh, at which point do we does the value of the grant change, um, and then what means test is is. is what, what is the amount of the means test, as well as the financing, um, how the grant is actually financed. <clears throat> so, 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 yeah, yeah. Um, so you'll see then the first pathway is a low ambition uh, pathway. And in this in this pathway from 2023 to 2025, we use the current value of this, the, the SRD grant um, to, 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 to decide on the, 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 the value of the grant. But then this, uh, and then in terms of the means testing, we use the food poverty line. That is from 2023 to 2024. Um, and then from 2026 to 2027, uh, the value of the grant increases uh, to the food poverty line, right? And so this, as, as, as you'll see in the results, as we increase um, the value of the grant and the means test, the number of beneficiaries also increase, uh, which means then we'd have to think of the ways in which the financing aspect can also help us uh, pay for this, uh, for this grant. And so then from 2028 to 2030, the grant increases to the upper bound uh, poverty line. And then this corresponds to a means test that is leveled at the upper bound poverty line from 2026 to 2030. And in this, in this pathway, um, the financing aspect uh, at which I will dis discuss briefly uh, we from 2023 to 2025, we used, we decided to implement a well tax leveled at 0.5 percent, right? And then from 2026 up until the end point, which is 2030, the well tax is increased to one percent, right? And then the the the, the increase of the well tax allows uh, us to actually support the rapid expansion of the grant, and like I said, as more beneficiaries increase, as the number of beneficiaries uh, increases. And then the second pathway, which is a medium uh, ambition uh, pathway, from 2023 to 2025, the grant is level with the food poverty line um, with the corresponding incest uh, at the lower bound poverty line from 2023 to 2025. Um, and then from 2023, uh, and we, the, the world tax is implemented at 1% uh, at a 1% uh, rate. And this goes on from 2023 henceforth. And then from 2026 to 2027, uh, 
the value increases uh, to the lower bound poverty line. And this is to like, as many have seen in many of our proposals, our statement in our work, we speak about the progressive increase uh, of, of the grant towards universality. And so you, you note here in the second scenario, the value um, and the means test uh, increased much more area in the scenario and at a higher rate. Um, and then in terms of the, the last endpoint is between 2028 and 2030, uh, where the value of the grant increases to the upper bound uh, poverty line. And then the means test here uh, is the upper bound poverty line that is doubled. Um, and then in terms of the financing, there are two particular key points uh, in the pathways. Uh, I've mentioned the world tax, and then from 2028, uh, a new social security tax is increased um, at up 3% of the wages uh, of the taxable income of those that earn uh, about 2.5 million. Um, and then the last pathway uh, is a high ambition uh, pathway. And in this scenario, uh, from 2023 to 2025, we started the food poverty line. Um, and then similar to the second part, we, we move up to the lower bound poverty line. And then lastly, stay at the upper bound poverty line. Um, the key difference here between the, the second and the third part we, um, is that the firstly from 2023 to 2025, the means test is double that of the upper bound uh, poverty line. In the second scenario, this is introduced much later, uh, later on uh, in, in 2028, whereas here it's introduced in 2023. So you see that the scale and the uh, expansion of the grant is much wider in this pathway. Um, and then from 2027 to uh, 2028, uh, the, the means test is uh, three times the, the value of the upbound poverty line. Um, and then lastly, from 2028 to 2030, six times the value of the upper bound poverty line, right? And so to cater for this rapid expansion um, of the grant, uh, the world tax, once again, is, is introduced from 2023 at a rate of 1%. And then from 2028, the social security tax now increases to about 4% uh, of the wages of the, uh, the taxable income uh, of about 2.5. Um, I'll pause it there for now. And then Asga will go into detail about how, in terms of the numbers, how does this expansion uh, affect the number of people that are beneficiaries of the grant? How do we actually finance it uh, in detail? And how do we calculate um, the increase of the value of the grant as well as the macroeconomic uh, indicators? Thank you, Zimbani. Um, we'll hand over to Dr. Asgar now to take us through the results modeling macroeconomic impacts of the alternative funding. Thank you very much. Um, just to um, not share the Thank you very much. Uh, 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 Nice to be here, and uh, this is the second time I'm invited to the Macroeconomic Policy Forum of HSRC to uh, discuss issues. And it's a you know, the initiative by the HSRC is very much welcome, uh, given that for many years discussions on macroeconomic policy has been, you know, uh, basically closed. Understand? So uh, I think for all the reasons that uh, Dr. Jacobs mentioned, uh, I think. It's a really, really uh, welcome move by the HSRC to bring people together and discuss these issues in various 
aspects of uh, uh, macroeconomic uh, policy issues and impact analysis that are needed to be done uh, as a well. problem. But um, uh, and, and thank you for IEJ. We have collaborated on, on this, you know, uh, on developing scenarios and then uh, with the idea of this, you know, doing the impact analysis. Um, I'm going to um, take you to move the first quickly overview of the aim of the project, introduce you to ADRS model that has been used for the project, uh, talk about the, the base scenario that we have run without the basic income grant to give us a, a base to compare uh, other results to. And then uh, I take you to the, the big pathways, third conditions and assumptions. And then um, go to each of the scenarios that Bali uh, mentioned in terms of their uh, uh, modeling of those and, and their results, and and uh, give you some uh, observations at the end. Um, the uh, the the purpose of this uh, project. Um, screen. Um, Uh, the uh, the aim of this project was uh, to use economic yes economic modeling techniques to quantify the macroeconomic and developmental impact of selected uh, big scenarios and their uh, implementation uh, pathways uh, and um, the, uh, um, the the model that we have used for the uh, for this project uh, is a uh, one of the ADRS's models. We have ADRS has built over the past uh, 20 years a suite of South African models. And uh, the, the, the one we use here is what's called the uh, VIMSIM Dynamically Integrated Macro, macro Simulation uh, Model. It's the same model we also use for the uh, minimum wage, uh, the introduction of minimum wage in South Africa, and assessment of various scenarios on minimum wage and, and many other. Um, you know, uh, uh, assessments uh, relating to COVID-19 or uh, macroeconomic policy choices, indirect scenarios, social securities, investment, public investments, other type of scenarios. Now, DIMSIM integrates ADRS as a macroeconometric model of South Africa, uh, MEMSA, and its household micro simulation model to capture the dynamic two-way interactions uh, between uh, the uh, the macroeconomy and households uh, uh, welfare and uh, uh, income distribution and, and welfare. It has a broad uh, heterodox theoretical foundation and utilizes modern time series uh, estimation methods uh, for building uh, the model system of equation. In other words, it's, a, it's an econometric model and uh, it is not a neoclassical model. Uh, uh, so, um, in terms of the, uh, uh, the, if I show you, if I use a, a flow chart of the model, the, the yellow part that, that you see, these are building blocks of the, the macroeconometric model, uh, and, and the, uh, the, uh, the green part is the macro simulation model that is integrated into the overall, uh, overall model. And, and the, the, the performance of the macroeconomy uh, influences the the, uh, the, the individuals and households and poverty and inequality, it impacts demand for uh, social security, cost of social security, tax uh, collections, uh, uh, direct and indirect taxes, PWP, all of these that are means tested, that are basically, if the economy become more job creating, higher goal, better job wages, it distributed among individuals and, and households, the demand for social security changes, the cost changes, and then on the one hand, it provides you the distributional impact of that scenario. On the other hand, the aggregates feedback into the macro model, to the income and expenditure of households and government, and feedback into the uh, into the uh, economy. Uh, so you have, on the one hand, the performance and the outlook for the economy impacts individuals and households. Like, for example, during the COVID-19, we had a situation that suddenly the, the economy was, was uh, receiving a many number of negative shocks. And, and people were losing jobs. In that situation, the macroeconomy, plural economy, receiving negative shocks, will also people in the macro economy, they were losing jobs, their income was dropping, and therefore the demand for social security and the cost of social security uh, were affected, tax collections were affected, 
and poverty and inequality will uh, affect. As the economy picks up and, and new jobs are created, uh, it will, uh, people who are unemployed in the micro simulation part get jobs and their income changes and their total cost. So that's the major interaction. The, the engine of this uh, model is a more than 400 estimated uh, equations uh, that are basically the using integration technique to determine the short-term and long-term um, determinants of behavior of the private sector, the investments, the productions, through the labor market, employment, wage rates, and uh, yeah, uh, looking at the consumption, household consumptions, and, and, and a number of other financial and, and, and uh, uh, variables uh, in the economy. That, those are behavioral equations that capture the, the working of the economy. And as you can see here, there are, uh, for example, in the demand side of the economy, we have uh, the consumption, investments, exports, imports. This is a multi sectoral model with 45 economic sectors uh, underlie uh, these models. And for each of the 41 sectors, the non aggregate uh, sectors, the, uh, we have estimated seven variables for each of the uh, 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 each of the sectors of the economy. These are output, employment, investment, exports, imports, prices, and wages. And, and the aggregates become the sum of the uh, relevant uh, subsectors. So the behavior of the sectors of the economy, the differential behavior, the uh, various uh, indicators of the sectors and the economy are captured at, at very detail. There's a bottom-up model. And, 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 and as you can see on the production side, for example, have large number of equations that capture sectoral output determination, sectoral prices, sectoral employment, uh, sectoral wage rates, sectoral exports and imports, and others, and and large number of accounting relationships that are making sure that the economy things are properly added together at various uh, levels. So we've used this model. This this model also has a web platform. We use a friendly web platform that we have uh, used for many years, for uh, over the past fifteen years, for training. Uh, and, 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 and now the, the, the Economic Modeling Academy, Emma, is using this model for also uh, to both providing access to students to, to the model and also uh, training uh, going over how, how the model is built, built and how to use it for various uh, scenario development, impact analysis and forecasting. So uh, let's have that in mind. We come back uh, to this uh, in terms of the uh, how, how the, the model captures the, the dynamic effect of the uh, basic income graph. Now, in terms of, as I mentioned, we, we start with a, a base scenario uh, or a business as usual scenario. And, and this is an important, uh, the base scenario plays an important role because on the one hand, it captures the main feature of the recent past and current economic policy uh, in order to provide the likely outlook for the economy without the basic income grant for the rest of this decade. Uh, and, and, and that enables us to compare and contrast the likely macroeconomic and development outcome of basic income uh, grant scenarios with the likely outlook for the economy without a uh, basic income grant. Uh, so that uh, uh, is, is very important. Uh, the, uh, as, the, as I discussed about the model, the base scenario also provides a, a, a platform and macroeconomic performance that the other basic income grants are being introduced. Um, we are uh, therefore recapturing a, a, the uh, macroeconomic policy, uh, current macroeconomic policy based on the fiscal policies uh, that limits annual increases in general government investment, 6.5% in nominal terms annually, and, and also government final consumption expenditure by 5% annually. Investment by public corporations in the model increases by 6.5%. Monetary policy, we assume, remains uh, the same. Inflation targeting adhere to over the, the rest of this decade. With respect to social policy, we assume that the social security program remains unchanged, uh, with grants amounts annually adjusting to inflation. The implementation of the phase four of EPWP continues without major changes in the number of job opportunities and and uh, remuneration. Uh, the new uh, major, uh, no new major social policy measures are going to be introduced during the next uh, eight years, and, and no changes will be made to direct or indirect taxes uh, during the next eight years. So we want to run the model based on a set of assumptions that capture the current policy to establish 
what kind of growth pack the economy is going to have, what kind of job creations, how many jobs are going to be created, and, 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 and therefore what kind of income remuneration is going to be created, and, and therefore when we introducing the basic income grant scenarios, which are all reinsisted, therefore are, are partly impacted by the, the assumption about the, the, the growth part of the economy. If we run the model that has a much faster economy growing than, than for example, uh, then the job creation would be higher income generation also directly to having means this set of policies that demand for the social security or basic income. And when we run this model, uh, we provide that uh, the, the results of the uh, simulations are captured uh, here. It basically uh, leads to a, about an average 2.2% average uh, GDP growth rate in real terms. Uh, the total demand in the economy represented by growth domestic expenditure was grow by about 2% average annually. Uh, it, it, shows that the, the, the both aggregate demand and the supply both in unemployment rate on average over the next eight years would be about 32.1% uh, and, and inflation about 4% and, and, and interest rate about 7%. And, and, and in terms of fiscal, uh, fiscal outcome uh, of, the, uh, of the scenario, uh, you, you find that the, uh, it shows that the, uh, um, um, not seen on my screen, uh, that the, 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 uh, the tax, uh, the overall uh, income tax relative to GDP would be about 15.7%. Uh, the total benefits paid by government, which includes all the grants, uh, current grants, is about 5%, 4.9%. Uh, and the, uh, the debt GDP ratio on average annually would be about 74.2%. 7, and the uh, average deficit GDP ratio on the uh, minus 3%. Uh, in terms of the, the model results uh, for, the, for the, the developmental side of uh, uh, projection of this scenario, it shows that the, there will be declines of declines in the poverty rate and, and the poverty gap and, and, and the inequality over the next eight years, uh, about the 20% decline in the, um, between 2030 and 2022 uh, in, the, in the poverty rate. And, and uh, about 25% decline in the poverty gap and, and Gini coefficient uh, reduction of the inequality income portfolio by about 10%, 9.8%. Um, so this is the, the first scenario that doesn't have a basic income grant. We say, what if the economy, there is no basic income grant? Current policies remain as they are, both macroeconomic and social policies. What is the outlook for the economy uh, in terms of growth, in terms of employment, unemployment, and in terms of uh, fiscal and poverty uh, distribution. Now, then uh, we want to introduce on, on this economy, uh, leave the macroeconomic policies and others in place, and what did we introduce in on this economy, the, uh, uh, this low growth path type of economy, uh, basic income grant uh, scenarios. Um, now, the uh, to uh, to kind of like uh, prepare you for in terms of the uh, the scenarios how the model captures the basic income grant pathway scenarios. Uh, uh, the model uh, was used to simulate the impact of three uh, big pathway scenarios uh, the, with the specific eligibility and entitlement conditions. It's very important because that will define how many people become eligible, how much they spend. On the eligibility requirements, it's focused only on adults. So the individual to be uh, eligible need to be between 18 and 59 years old, should not receive any other grants and, and should pass the specified uh, individual <coughs> means test that is provided by uh, each of the three scenarios. In, in terms of the entitlement condition, uh, the three big scenarios uh, differ in terms of their monthly payments to eligible individuals. Uh, the grant amount will be uh, equivalent to either SRD amount or the, uh, the food poverty line or low bond poverty line or upper bond poverty line. As, as you can see. The grant amounts are also uh, adjusted annually uh, to by 5%, uh, or these, uh, the poverty lines are adjusted by 5% annually. Uh, all current grants also annually adjust to inflation. The SRD grant adjustment uh, uh, for inflation only begins uh, from 2023. Uh, from after 2023, 
and the new grant and the new grant will go into effect 2023. So we the model runs introduces the basic income grant these scenarios from this year and simulated uh, annually all the way to 2030. Uh, and now the uh, finally the uh, uh, the uh, uh, an important assumption also is made that the uh, that the take up rate for the new grant for the new basic income grant will be 60% during the first year thereafter the rate will increase annually by 3% point until it reaches the maximum of 81% by 2030 uh, so uh, IEJ has written about this in, in uh, in terms of the take up rate and, and and we have incorporated that into simulation results that you see it, it, it incorporates that into the numbers and the cost we have implications there um, in terms of the the poverty lines also it's important as i mentioned these are the starting point of the poverty line where we're starting the srd grant food and food poverty line lower bound poverty line and, and one uh, and the upper bound poverty line as i mentioned they are each of these are assumed to increase uh, by 5% annually. The 5% comes from looking at the stats SS over time adjustments of the poverty line that uh, we found that the compound annual growth rate of about 5% uh, over the years of these, and that's how the 5% growth of these uh, various amounts is in place. In DIMSIM, the poverty they uh, uses the annual value of the upper bound poverty line uh, for its annual projections of income poverty and poverty gap, which is different from the grants issue in terms of when you can do the estimation for what is the projection of the rate of poverty, it is based on the upper bound poverty line and its evolution uh, over time. Uh, um, so then um, moving on uh, in terms of another preparing you for the what comes in terms of the scenarios results, uh, for the examination of financial uh, financially feasible, feasibility of big uh, uh, pathways, a wealth tax and a social security tax module were added to the uh, to the model. And and in terms of uh, that, the body also mentioned. But in terms of how the what is the, what, what is meant by wealth tax and what is meant by social security, how it is done and how it implemented in the simulations where the numbers come from. When you see, let me just spend uh, a few minutes in explaining each. Uh, the wealth tax. Basically, as uh, is, is introduced, is used uh, because South Africa's high concentration of wealth is, is well known. It is widely recognized that the share of wealth held by the top 10% is between 85 to 90%. Uh, now, DIMSIM wealth tax uh, module uh, is linked both uh, uh, in, uh, is linked to both macroeconomic and macro simulation component uh, of the model. On the one hand, it uses the model's annual projection of the uh, uh, household's net worth uh, to establish the taxable portion of the wealth. For example, we have the net worth of the household is a time series provided by the Reserve Bank that the model is integrated in its estimations and its projections. And, and every year, it, it's about right now, uh, the total net worth of household is about 15 trillion rand, about uh, three times the size of the GDP. Uh, that's the net worth of the uh, households. Um, these are stocks we're talking about, not stock markets, but not the flow. We're talking about the uh, houses and, and shares and financial savings and other skills. Now, in each period, the model, the macro model part, projects uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the net worth of the households, and then we apply to that the uh, a portion of this we say is taxable, uh, and, and that would be, for example, 50%. It then the model uh, annual projection of household net worth, uh, then it, it then calculates the annual total wealth tax by applying the tax rate, like 1% or half a percent, 2% to the taxable portion of the wealth. That's at the macro level. The macro simulation part of the model uh, tests and allocate the annual total. Uh, wealth tax that is calculated, uh, that we just went through, uh, it, 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 it basically uh, uh, tests and allocated among the adult taxpayers in the top quantile. Uh, so that concentration of wealth that we know is very much high in the, within the top quantile, we use that information 
to uh, uh, to to say the amount of uh, wealth tax that we want, the overall wealth tax that we want to be collected, to be collected from the taxpayers in that part. Uh, so these are all coded and, and parameterized in the in the model for that for the wealth tax project. The social security tax model of Vincent is, is simple. It, it, it is a uh, it applies um, a flat social tax rate, like three percent to wages up to taxable maximum of 2.5 million. That means anybody uh, all the way to you know uh, to 2.5 million will be three percent, and anybody making above 2.5 million will still pay tax at uh, 2.5 million uh, income. Uh, this is a simple approach to a social security tax program that can be further developed to include additional uh, options in the future. And Timsim Social Security Tax is built as a module of its micro simulation component. For each year of the forecast period, the model uses its detailed database of individuals, uh, labor market and, and participation in the labor market participation and income to test eligibility of individuals uh, and, and to calculate their social security uh, amounts. And, um, and social security tax is normally deducted uh, from employees by, uh, by their earning by, by their employers and by the government to give that to the government. So these are the two uh, modules that were developed also preparing in terms of possibility of using it for the running of the scenario. Now, uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the macro dynamics that we are capturing when we introducing the basic big in the in the in Dimson, uh, the initial impact of the policy on government expenditure and household income will, is expected to revibrate throughout uh, the economy. On one hand, the increase in household income will stimulate production from economic sectors that in turn leads to higher investments, employment, and, and income. That's the demand side effects on the real uh, economy on the production. Higher uh, growth domestic expenditure in the economy will especially generate higher value added tax, higher expenditure, higher by household uh, increases back to revenue that can help finance the, the new grant. Uh, thirdly, the expected stimulus effect of a basic income grant program uh, will benefit the private sector and their household income. Uh, this is something that was also brought up earlier. The growth effects of it, the increase in demand, will obviously, those are stimulates private sector uh, production and benefits. The big scenarios, therefore, can have positive aggregate demand and aggregate supply. It's not just the demand measure, it also through its impacts, uh, its consumption expenditures and its impact on the, uh, on the production, it becomes aggregate demand and aggregate, both aggregate demand and aggregate supply are being affected as we will see in the simulation. So, uh, significant transfers to poor household will help reduce the poverty rate and depth of poverty. And as the bottom quantiles becomes the main beneficiaries of a, a big program, income distribution is expected uh, to improve. Uh, now, these dynamic economic interactions are captured and quantified uh, to the 3,208 equations of the model and its links to a full macro simulation model, which people just take you through. Um, in terms of the first scenario, low ambition, uh, big uh, pathway, as Ali mentioned, it is characterized by the starting 20, 2023 to 2024, starting with the food poverty line, moving to low, low bond poverty line, and gradually to upper bond poverty line after 2000, from 2026 onwards. The amount of grant is, is SRD initially until 2025, and then food poverty line and lower bond poverty. This is considered a, a low ambition basic income grant. Uh, when we run the model for in terms of the, the uh, estimating the number of the project number of the eligible, uh, uh, eligible so for the for beneficiaries of the, this, it, it gradually increases from 9.4 million in 2023 to 13.3 million by 2030, taking into account the 60, 80% take off. Uh, so these are Individual income test, so the, uh, the means test that is used uh, uh, here, uh, the, the means test that we have here used is applied at individual income, not family income, and, and, and then taken account that, that, that initially there's lower 
uh, take up weight and decline. So we have here in this scenario about between 9.4 9 million in 2023 and, and 13.3 million by 2030. As the means test expands, uh, now the in terms of cost and finance, uh, the uh, the financing needs of this scenario, we have simulated a, a, a number of scenarios and, and try to to uh, uh, to and this is the final outcome. We think that it can be met through introduction of a wealth tax uh, at half a percent between 2023 and 2025, and then. Uh, increasing to 1% to uh, between 2026 and 2030. Uh, so as you can see here, the, the, the graph, the bars shows that the wealth tax uh, and the, uh, the uh, second um, part of the support for paying for this is that increase in the VAT revenue that the model estimates that enables by the, uh, the scenarios positive impact on the gross domestic expenditure demand and how spending. And it's not just demand by household. Both domestic expenditure is, is the sum of household expenditure, uh, government spending, and, and investment. Uh, so you see that in, in this here we, we the, the cost because of the, the lower the uh, the low means test and the low take uh, take up uh, the, the cost of the basic income is relatively lower. So we are uh, suggesting a low wealth tax of half a percent. And the, 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 the gray area is the, the VAT uh, extra uh, revenue that is generated as a result of the expansion that, that you that come out from the basic. But as, as the, uh, uh, the, the scenario moves to lower bond and, and means and the number of beneficiaries expands and the cost expands, we suggest increasing the, the wealth tax to 1%. Uh, between 2000, uh, after 2026, and, and then you have the rest of the VAT collections come from that higher. So at the end, what you see here, that the blue line shows that the cost of the grant as it grows, and the bars shows that how the, the rising of the finance uh, basically try to match with the cost of the uh, grant and the, and the composition of that rising finance here from wealth tax and how what portion of the how much of it come from the expected to come from the value added. Obviously, this changes as, as we go through the different scenarios, this uh, in cost and the, the, the combination change. Um, in terms of the macroeconomic impact of this scenario, the low bound scenario, uh, relative to the base scenario, the, this uh, low ambition scenario will be responsible for increase in average real GDP from 2.2% over the next eight years to 2.8%, uh, adding about 0.6 percentage points to the uh, to the growth rate of the average real growth of the economy. Uh, it leads to about half a percentage points increase in annual, uh, uh, in average annual real per capita GDP. It stimulates both uh, aggregate demand and aggregate supply. As you can see, the aggregate supply uh, average uh, growth goes to 2.6 percent and aggregate demand also in the economy to 2.6. Aggregate supply is calculated based on the uh, growth value added uh, basic price or, or in other words the production of the sectors of the economy on the production side. Aggregate demand is calculated from the expenditure side of the GDP which is the household consumption, the government spending, uh, uh, final consumption expenditure, investment exports and imports. That uh, and the two uh, the two sides of two ways of calculating the GDP. And unemployment rate uh, is also uh, declined relative to the uh, average unemployment rate. Annual unemployment rate declined by about two point four percent as a result of this uh, scenario. In terms of fiscal impact of this scenario, uh, you find that the uh, the government total uh, benefit paid GDP ratio increases. That's where the uh, the grant payments uh, 4.9 percent without basic income grant rising to 8.5 percent expected as average annually uh, income tax uh, 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 GDP ratio also increases uh, and, and 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 the government expenditure GDP ratio as the as the government starts implementing basic income grant and taking into account the, the GDP growth impact of its overall as 
the, the, the expenditure GDP ratio goes up, but at the same time, income expenditure, income G, the government income GDP ratio also goes up. And then the, because of the, the wealth tax, because of the, the VAT increase in the VAT. And as a result, the, the uh, average annual uh, deficit GDP ratio is, is only increases by uh, 0.3 percentage points. And the debt GDP ratio remains more or less similar to the basic income. In terms of uh, poverty and distribution, household impact of it, the rate of decline of the poverty rate between 2023 and 2000 would be 33% faster than the projected rate for the base in there. So here is at the decline of the base in the 21, 22% implies that the decline is 29%. Uh, and, and the poverty gap similarly significantly declined, helps the basic income grant that the low emissions significantly reduces the, the depth of poverty, in other words, and, and Gini coefficient also significantly uh, declines. In other words, the economy is not becoming, given the beneficial result of uh, bottom households, uh, bottom quantiles, uh, implement the Gini coefficients. Um, now, moving to the next uh, uh, next scenario, you have the uh, thought of the scenario or the basically the mean stress and grant amount. This is a medium ambitious scenario. So it starts with the mean stress of the lower bound poverty line, uh, move to upper bound poverty line, and then to two times upper bound poverty line. Uh, so, uh, uh, and then the, the grant amount also move from full poverty line to low bound poverty line, upper bound. So this is, is the, uh, the net has become wider and the, the grant amounts also gradually become bigger. So we expect larger uh, number of beneficiaries and higher costs as a result. So the simulation shows that the, uh, the, the number of the beneficiaries, those are applying the 60-80%, the number, number of uh, beneficiaries increases from starting from 9.4 uh, million uh, to uh, goes to about 15 million by 2030. Now, the uh, uh, numbers are not hugely different from the base scenario, uh, but the cost of it is, is, is uh, higher because of because the, the grant amount is more generous. Now, in terms of how does the model, the, uh, this, is, this is presenting you, we have run many, many simulations and tested and try to find the, the, you know, uh, how to bring the cost in the model estimation and also revenue generations to, to, to get it. Uh, we think that the financing needs of this scenario can be met to introduction of wealth tax at one percentage uh, going from 2003, uh, 2023 onwards. In the first scenario, we had half a percent tax and then later on it to 1%. And, and, and here is from the beginning, given the rise in the cost of the, the, the higher cost of the grant, we suggest a 1% uh, increase in the 1% wealth tax. Introduction of a social security tax in 2008, same as the first one, 3% of wages up to two, two and a half million. And then you obviously had the, the other component that helped pay for this increase in the VAT revenue uh, on the, because of the positive impact of the scenario. So if you look at the graph here at the beginning, we found that through multiple simulation, that the combination of a 1% wealth tax and the revenue generation addition to the VAT is enough to pay the cost at the time. So there was no need to introduce social security tax. Uh, more or less, they were close this. And then later on, as the cost, the blue line goes up and, and, and the wealth tax and the VAT collection is not enough, we're introducing social security tax and in order to make this uh, close to each other. In the paper, we're going to introduce also a saving, social security savings. So what is extra here is kept and later on will be used to, you know, uh, to pay for uh, needed In terms of impact of this scenario, it has a more significant impact. It helps uh, raise the GDP, uh, the average uh, growth of the GDP by one percentage point from the base scenario percentage point. It, it, it expands the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, real uh, higher goals or leads to higher goals of the uh, real per capita GDP. It raises the, uh, both the aggregate demand and aggregate supply here is, again, we have uh, the, the rise in the demands 
in production side and they both the, the, from the sectoral side of the model and from the demand side we see growth uh, and as a result of the, the balanced growth that are both in the very first scenario and in the second scenario and the unemployment rate will be uh, dropping by about 3.9 percentage points relative to the base scenario more significant drop in the unemployment uh, rate uh, you, and, and, and then we have the uh, CPI a little higher 6.9 percent to 7.1 percent um, these are basically macro some of the macroeconomic indicators um, we have a lot more but I thought these are key ones to you know informative about this scenario in terms of fiscal impact uh, of the of the scenario the, uh, the this medium ambitious scenario is expected to raise the average annual uh, government expenditure GDP ratio by 6.6 percent so if you look at government expenditure from base scenario now with this medium average annual rises to 38.4 percent but those tax policies and, and that we suggested and the rise in the uh, expected that also rises the the government revenue both designed to come from the from the wealth tax, introduction of wealth tax, or later on social security tax, and from the back, it also increases government uh, revenue GDP ratio. And overall, we'll see that the deficit GDP ratio average annually will increase by about 1.1% annually, and the debt GDP ratio uh, remains about by about 1.2%. In terms of poverty and inequality, this is a much more significant uh, impact. It has a much more significant impact uh, as as the, the, the scenarios start paying the uh, more of a higher amount close to the poverty line, which in the model is upper bound poverty line. As people receive that, they will automatically able to out of poverty. Um, and, and, and so uh, so we have a basically as a result we have the poverty. Uh, uh, rate uh, in the, uh, the second scenario of basically the rate of its rate of decline two and a half times than the the, uh, the rate of decline in the base scenario. Uh, and, and, and relative to the base scenario, the, the, this medium uh, ambitious scenario is expected to reduce the depth of poverty even more significantly uh, from, you know, before the base scenario decline by about minus 25% within eight years. Here by declining by 82%. In other words, the um, you know people because whether some people will move, move out of poverty, but the poverty gap, which is the distance between the poverty line and the household income added together and the, the poverty line is um, move closer or move to the poverty line or move out of poverty line. Uh, as expected, this uh, medium uh, uh, ambition big. Uh, mainly benefits the poor and low-income individual. As a result, uh, it also uh, helps uh, significantly to reduce the uh, income inequality, GDP, which is something that the DDG was also mentioning. We have also the impact of the scenario. Uh, in the model, we have also provincial projections, but I didn't think that it would be best to give you an overlook of some of these uh, details and by gender value. By the way, sent by one child. Um, now, finally, we have the, the, the last scenario is the high ambition scenario. Here, the, the, the grant amounts move between full poverty line to upper bound poverty line. The main change is, is about the, uh, the, the net is much wider, starting with the two times upper bound poverty line by 2026 and 27, it becomes four times upper bound poverty line. Than six standards. If this is a, a scenario toward the universal basic income grant, so at this point, if the poverty line of upper bound poverty line requirements is already met, we you know uh, moving uh, beyond uh, that in terms of the uh, scenario. Uh, and as a result of this, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 number of beneficiaries uh, increases from initially become uh, 2020 11.1 million. To increase it to about almost 20 million by 2030. So we have uh, in this scenario gradually uh, the numbers uh, beneficiaries significantly increase and those payments increases. Now, in terms of financing this scenario, uh, in, 
similarly that you can see the cost of it is captured and gradually go up and the shift that you mean to see it as, as the means test changes the, or the, the poverty line uh, or the amount of the grant changes you have a shift so the blue line shows you how much well, how many billion from about a hundred or so billion to all the way to about uh, 500 uh, billion uh, by 2030 and and how it gets financed initially we found that they again the, uh, the wealth tax of, of 1% that is introduced in 2023 would be enough with, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the value added tax that is an additional value added tax that the generated political space enabled to pay more or less for the, for the, uh, for the scenario for the cost. Uh, but as the, the, as the expands, as, as the uh, grant expands, still by 2027, the combination of that 1% wealth tax and the increase in back of enough. But by the time you get in 2028 and to 2030, where the, the means test has increased to six times upper bond poverty line and the, is the payments of upper bond poverty line, we introduce a social security tax of 4% of wages up to taxable uh, 2.5 million. And that brings that additional uh, you know, the revenue, which is basically bring us closer to, to the overall cost. Um, and, 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 and what is not met by these three combinations, then annually it, it, it basically becomes fiscal uh, increase in deficit spending. But we try to minimize that requirement of you know, de deficit spending and debt by, by having tax policies that are helping the, the process and that tax policy is within the, the, the simulation of extracting all the interaction accounts. Here in the in this scenario, in terms of macroeconomic impacts of it, uh, it would be a little more significant from you know uh, we had a one percent in the second scenario added average annual growth rate. Here it adds about one point two percent to the average annual growth rate. Uh, again, the, uh, there will be a 4.9 percentage point decrease in average annual unemployment rate. Here, the unemployment rate declined from 32.1 to 27.2 uh, percent uh, in the next eight years, and and and, and it stimulate and, and and again it stimulates this scenario also stimulates both aggregate demand and aggregate supply. We see how close they remain together. Uh, in terms of uh, Fiscal uh, uh, impact of the scenario, uh, the uh, the benefit GDP ratio, the government paid general paid uh, GDP ratio increases, and 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 tax revenue uh, also the uh, tax income increases by about uh, two 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 percent, and as government expenditure increases from thirty one point eight percent to forty percent forty point seven percent, our both from tax revenue, from back revenue, and also the, the social security tax of 4% after 2028 and 1% wealth tax, uh, it will also uh, bring us to, uh, to, to raise the revenue. And overall, the average deficit GDP ratio went to minus three to minus five percent. It is possible easily to simulate the model with, for example, a little higher wealth tax from one to uh, one and a half or social security tax and in order to increase government revenue. Uh, so this is pretty conservative. We can actually, uh, if, if for example, there's a concern about this, you know, we want to keep the deficit low, that in the tax mechanism that model uh, rates can help. And the debt GDP ratio remains as you know, about 3% higher. Uh, in terms of uh, impact on poverty, uh, about two thirds of this in this scenario, now, while the second scenario reduces poverty rate by about 50%, bit more than 50% here, it, it, it reduces poverty rate by about two thirds uh, uh, over the next eight years, which is highly significant. It only reduces the uh, poverty gap and, and also almost double uh, the, uh, the decline, the relative to the base scenario decline in the income quality. Putting it all together, uh, these three scenarios, um, and with the base scenario, in the base scenario, you had average annual growth rate of 2.2%. The three scenarios, low, medium, and high, would provide you a higher average annual growth rate over the next eight years. Uh, we did also the unemployment rate, 
The average annual in the base scenario without basic income grant would be 32.1%. It gradually, that average unemployment rate declined and uh, in each, each, each basic income scenario, each of those factors. In terms of poverty rate, the, the, the base scenario lead to some reduction about minus 20% decline in poverty rate, but the basic income grant scenario uh, to, uh, depending on uh, all three of them rises will have a much uh, higher uh, decline in the poverty rate and the same with the poverty gap. Uh, in terms of inequality also the, uh, the, uh, uh, the base scenario is declining in the about 10% decline in the poverty in the income inequality over the next 10 years over the next 10 years but uh, it will be much more significant uh, reduction uh, if on this target in the uh, much higher much better employment, much better poverty uh, rate decline. In terms of debt GDP ratio, uh, we have, you know, about the seven, which captures deficits and have together uh, well, is, is that uh, the, the base scenario produces average annual of 74.2%, uh, and, and, and the other scenarios remain more or less, I would say, uh, on the same ballpark. Explosion. Of the uh, of the debt GDP ratio. Final uh, slide is that we basically use ADRS uh, uh, to quantify the macroeconomic and development impact of three basic uh, income grant pathways. Our analysis show that one, the three big pathways are each effective policies to significantly reduce poverty and inequality to varying. For example, the medium and high ambitious big scenarios are able to reduce income poverty by half, by almost two thirds by 2030, respectively. The big program is undoubtedly a poor social policy program. In all the evidence, internationally, it is pretty clear, and here we also uh, uh, show that. In addition to their significant uh, desired impact on poverty and inequality. We also show the simulation results show that the scenarios also have tangible positive impact on growth and employment. So we have developmental impact positive, we have growth and employment impact. Finally, our simulations of the three big uh, pathways show that the combination of a relatively small wealth tax, half a percent and one percent, and social security tax between uh, 3% and 4% can provide the necessary complementary resources that enable government to introduce and sustain the program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Muni, for your presentation and your research and insights. Um, so, because of time constraints, we won't be able to take questions, but I would like to encourage our virtual audience to log in their questions in the Q&A box, um, because we have to simply move on to our panel discussion. So, now I'll hand over to Dr. Masani Bani, who will facilitate the session for us. Wow, 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 is what I can say. What this shows is that the stuff is not just pie in the sky that people are just dreaming of, but it's concrete, it's realizable, you know, there's evidence that backs it. And I think that is very critical because for so long, you know, um, the those who have been in opposition claimed a number of spurious things saying that it's not something that is feasible but thank you very much for for that I, and i think we can see that this is something that actually can be done i'm sorry i hope i'm not influencing the panelists anyway. <laughs> but I, but in the absence of comments and questions i i had to say my wow okay um so 
uh, this session I've been asked to facilitate a discussion amongst uh, our esteemed panel, panelists who are basically going to give their own reflections and takes. And uh, the first panelist is Mr. Rudy Dix. I hope he's online. Uh, for those of you who don't know, but I'm sure many of you who would have encountered Mr. Dix, uh, he is the head of, of the project management office in the uh, private office of the president. And he is responsible for supporting the implementation of the presidential employment stimulus, the presidential youth employment initiative, as well as and blocking regulatory challenges that impact on employment and uh, economic growth. So, uh, um, Mr. Dix, um, if you may. I don't know where you're calling me, Mr. Dix, Sasani. Rudy is fine. Oh, Rudy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not going to call Ashka Professor Ashka. I'm going to call him Ashka. <laughs> <laughs> Please That's go fair. ahead. You never know. You know, people are sensitive about titles. So I'm, I, I'd rather be guided and led by you. Uh, so, do you have any um, general re reflections on the modeling that has been presented today or the, or the broader discussion? Thanks, Rustani. I mean, Asuka always provides very interesting uh, dynamics and these models have always, uh, you know, in a sense, tested the traditional aggregate demand models that have been um, presented by different people within National Treasury or Stellenbosch or so, but but in every model, right? It's 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 dependent on what you put in. Uh, what are those um, variables that you put in to be able to get uh, to what your particular sets of outcomes are? So before I ask a few questions or make a couple of comments, not questions, and and I think because we won't have time to potentially answer all of it, Asga and I will will take this uh, clearly clearly offline. I just think it's a useful debate, and this is quite important for us, right, in the context of where we're sitting. We know, for example, that by introducing the social relief of the CES grant, combined with the presidential employment stimulus, that had significant impact on, um, on um, you know, on households, low-income households in particular. We've seen the presidential employment stimulus being quite central in reducing that uh, narrow unemployment rate. Um, Nick Spillow, for example, and the team at Stellenbosch have done quite a bit of work on the SRD impact, particularly the, the initial grants that were developed during um, during our COVID response, which was the caregivers grant, and showed, for example, how phenomenal the impact of introducing a caregivers grant versus SRD was, and the difference that that, that it was. Um, both, of course, have been absolutely important in uh, you know meeting uh, really uh, some of the most basic stuff. Um, and not, although not at the at the at the food poverty line, it has been quite important in contributing towards uh, household income, particularly where household income is pooled uh, to meet basic needs. So I, I think this is quite important. The second point is that I think it's quite critical for the debate as it is. Um, you know, we've been engaging with uh, you colleagues, with a whole set of different colleagues who are attending here from civil society, community-based organisations, um, um, organised labour and business in the NEDLAC context. And I think it's very, very important for us to be able to see this kind of contribution as a serious contribution um, in the work that has been done um, towards, uh, you know, whatever form of social security or social intervention that is going to that is going to happen. Of course, there's a debate in government as it is, not only outside of government but inside of government. What are the best measures? Do we do we look at you know in, you know interventions and support from the first place towards employment? Uh, Supporting interventions, um, you know, um, lots of debates, con controversial as albeit it may be, around whether you know we need to continue paying, um, you know, in income grants, you know, uh, to various to various degrees, including whether there is a continuation of the SRD grant. So I, I think this is an important part of that debate. And again, from our side, um, you know, the president has committed, and I'm here to ensure that. We continue that conversations with colleagues here around, uh, you know, uh, consulting, listening to the inputs that are there, 
uh, and informing, um, you know, eventually what is it that we need to input into an overall conversation that we would have to have in government and with with social partners broadly. So I just thought that's important to set that context. Um, I'm also just interested in why Ashka talks about the means test, the legibility criteria, right? Where he says, um, excluding those who are receiving a grant. I mean, the one thing we did find was that when you do um, not exclude them from a grant, it, uh, it obviously helps us to pull for example, household income, because if you not look at the individual, you look at the, the ability to pull household income, the impact is much, much more significant. Does it also mean when you exclude those who receive a grant, those who are in employment um, or receiving a UIF grant, does that, does that, I'm sorry, a UIF benefit? So I think it's important just to, just to clarify that. Aska, you know, I'm going to, um, uh, the, the second question that relates to, are you using the existing tax thresholds? Because I'm not quite sure um, you know, whether you're using the current and existing tax thresholds that are there. Asga, I think that, um, I think you're probably being a little bit too ambitious on the employment scenario, although I thought, um, you know, um, we've not yet recovered from COVID. So we have seen in the last year, phenomenal growth in employment, right? I mean, that's quite a useful way of probably looking at it. Um, um, we've never seen a growth of 1.5 million jobs in real terms, right? So, so that's the, that's the kind of growth that you've seen. I mean, generally speaking, most of the annual growth, annual employment growth it is, has been just below uh, 1 million. So for the first time in a very long time, you've seen um, significant recovery and push in employment. I, I suspect a lot of that may just be because of public employment. Um, it may also just be that, you know, you've seen some recovery in, um, in of course, um, um, agriculture um, uh, services, for example, particularly fi financing, financial, global business services, and of course, um, 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 digital and tech, which continue to grow even during, 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 the, during the lockdown. So I, I think it's just, you know, I, I do think that, you know, you may be a bit ambitious, although I, I think part of it would be to see how we able to significantly reduce that. So comment on that. Um, I also just think that, you know, the, the, the most, imp the one part, as go about the model is that you, you tend to only provide a positive scenario. So um, what happens in the context of an impact on the continued war in, in Eastern Europe, for example, um, and that impact that it has, for example, on oil and food prices. Um, and I think this is something that one would have to take into consideration. Partly so because I think some of the ind indicators, both from the World Bank, the IMF and the OECD, indicates a negative reverse in um, both employment and potentially still seeing through um, you know, additional increases in inflation. Of course, this is exogenous inflation as it is, but nonetheless, um, oil prices as it is right now, if for example, the price cap gets in, in, implemented, or for example, as Russia has done, um, has literally cut down the supply by 500 million, um, Barrels, 500,000 barrels a day. So these are these are important exogenous factors that I think potentially one would have to factor in in a in a negative scenario, you know, particularly growth as well. I'm also just trying to figure out what happened to because in your in your baseline scenario you also refer to um, the uh, you know expenditure as a uh, sorry um, investment as a percentage of GDP, and you looked at the SOE sector, the state sector, right? I don't see that coming through because I, I think that there's a real risk that that in itself would put a damp on, on, on further investment and growth if that's not driven through particularly investments in energy, which has been lagging quite significantly so, and certainly investment, investments in road and rail, uh, sorry, in, uh, in logistics, where you've seen um, um, some significant decline in investment by, by transit, for instance. These are drivers of growth, by the way. So if these two SOEs are not investing, then you are relatively you are, you are going to see a negative uh, growth or a decline in investment, not negative, a decline in investment of the private sector as a percentage of as a percentage of GDP. And so what happens to the G, um, you know, um, gross um, capital formation in the in the in the scenarios that they? My last point, and sorry, Basani, for this, is just you know one also has to take into account you know the fact that the the pay tax base 
is very limited and small, right? Um, and, you know, does this take into consideration, for example, a, a, a negative scenario where you do see significant erosion of tax compliance or, for example, taxpayers deciding to move to different uh, jurisdictions? And you, and you see that um, happening more and more. Um, I, I wonder whether that is, for example, uh, factored in, um, assuming that taxpayers would be willing to fork from a, a low scenario of 0.5 to 1% to a high scenario of in excess of 4%. But this also in the context of a conversation that should be held in parallel to this, where similar uh, proposals are being put as to how we fund uh, national health insurance. Right, so, so you have a conversation of the national health insurance, you know, having a very similar intervention and support where you, you'll see this through the tax base um, funding in the national health insurance. Um, some of it, of course, not all of it. And, and a very similar scenario here of taxpayers having to fork out for, um, you know, a basic income grant. Um, one wonders the kind of threshold of where taxpayers, you know, are basically saying, well, this is enough, right? So. So tax despondency, tax avoidance, um, um, people just basically saying we're not longer prepared to. And there are many reasons for why they do that. You know, I mean, I think some of us who are honest and genuine taxpayers, if we see that tax money is being spent on what it's intended to, I think that's quite that's going to be quite critical and important. But if it goes, for example, into a general fiscus and it gets transferred to uh, a grant for roads or a grant for water, and we're not quite sure what happens to that grant. These are the kind of indications where you have quite a bit of, um, you know, pushback from taxpayers in relation to this. So those are my my general questions. Uh, we can take it offline. I think it's really really good contribution and and some really interesting uh, information that has come through, particularly on 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 the impact it has. I think that's quite significant and that's quite important, particularly for the two key critical indicators around, um, you know, poverty gaps, poverty um, 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 reduction, and of course, um, gene. Um, inequality, uh, sorry, the inequality um, um, variable. Um, thanks, thanks so much, Dosani. Sorry for taking a bit of time, but quite excited to be able to engage on this. Thank you. Um, I think the room is in on mute. Thank you. 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 Okay, thanks very much, Rudy, for those reflections. And I was wondering if I could um, ask you just a follow-up question as you were talking about taxation um, and uh, the implications of taxation. I just want to get a sense, um, you know, there is this growing support um, for a wealth tax to, to, to fund uh, expanded social security from some groups, right? What is your perspective on whether, uh, you know, new forms of progressive taxations are actually needed? I mean, you, 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 did, you did mention, um, you know, if they were to be in, uh, 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 introduced, there would be all these uh, unintended consequences. But just uh, do you think that, uh, you know, these types of new forms, whether it be the wealth tax, um, are in fact needed? Uh, to support various social security uh, uh, um, active, uh, yeah, social security policies. So certainly, yes, of course. I mean, I think you would have to look at the, the spectrum of tax tax policies that are there. Um, I mean, again, one one hasn't seen the the details of Ashka's model and what what the potential, you know. 
um, revenue that could be raised through that, assuming, of course, that, um, you know, politically, this can, this can fly with taxpayers, of course. That's going to be quite critical. Um, you know, um, VAT, which is a regressive tax, of course, um, you know, was increased by one percentage point. Um, and it brought in, I think, just over 30 billion, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so you'd have to look at different models. I mean, I would rather put my finger on saying, are there other ways of trying to deal with it um, in a manner to fund a whole set of programs? And I think it's important. I qualify this. I'm not saying only for B BIG. A whole set of programs that we need to think through that are going to be important. Because as we debate this, I mean, I, I would say, for example, the Sunny, one of the more important parts is are we able to fund the public employment programs? And this is the other question also that Ashka puts in his model, which he refers to a baseline owner of EPWP. I, I think it would be important, Ashka, to look at what does it mean with the introduction of the presidential employment stimulus from October 2020 and the impact that has had, right? Because um, after two years, we've been able to create one million opportunities. Um, quite significantly, so the program in the school, um, which has uh, seen, you know, 200, well, today, 275,000 um, young people participating in 22,000 schools, right? Paid at minimum wages, for instance. So I'm just saying, I think for me, I would not say just only welfare. I think we'd have to look at the total taxation spectrum around how we get some regressive, um, progressivity into the, into the tax base. I mean, the most important part for all of us here that pay tax, right? Assuming all of us pay tax, is that we want to know that, um, you know, particular sets of tax. Uh, increases. Now, all of us are willing to pay extra tax. Well, some of us don't. But let's assume all of us are willing to pay extra tax to deal with inequality or deal with poverty, because that is that in itself has a, unintended consequences, right? Um, or we have to pay significantly so to our family members who are not employed, or um, you know, extended family members and a whole and a whole set of different things. Um, the, the point is, are we going to spend it on that? And I think this is where the question comes in from government. And how do we ensure that? that we are able to deliver, deliver on that. So I, I, I just think that uh, instead of saying yes on a, on, a, on a wild tax in the way that it's been done, I think there's a conversation to be had on different formulations of what, what should be done uh, around this, for example. The, the Davis Tax Commission has suggested a number of other forms of taxation to fund some of this. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether it's going to be sufficient enough to be able to do this. As it is, you saw the figures that it, that it relates to SRD, SRD just for its current limit of, of where it is right now is 50 billion rand, rough, roughly give or take 50 billion rand, right? Uh, so we're not even talking here of the food poverty line or the lower bound um, 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 uh, poverty line, for instance. Um, and, and again, I, I think that's, that's something that introduces quite an interesting subject. And that's why I think this, is a, this needs to be part of the debate around what is it that we think would be an important social security intervention that supports, um, you know, and it supports unemployed, particularly young people, and getting them into employment opportunities as the first thing. And secondly, those who fall through the cracks, what are we able to do to be able to support them through, a, through an income support program? Thanks. Uh, Rachel Bukasa. Uh, Rachel, am I heard? No. Yeah. Says you are muted. Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> oh, she can hear me. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Rudy. Uh, and we're just turning to Rachel Bukasa. Uh, and Rachel is the executive director of the Black Sash and an NGO NPO specialist with experience in strategic planning, program development, management, fundraising, and a whole range of other things. Um, so, uh, Rachel, uh, you know, the Black Sash has played quite a leading role among civil society groups campaigning for a UBE. So in light of today's discussion, uh, we would like to invite you to just offer some reflections on why you believe South Africa needs a UBE and, and observations on the results of the scenario modeling that, you, that you've just heard. Sure, thank you um, for the opportunity to speak. I think one, one of the key things, uh, particularly from the professor's presentation, is something we've been saying all along, that there are various models and ways in which this can work. Um, and that where we are as a country, we're not in a position where we can sort of bury our heads in the sand and hope 
you know, we carry on as we've been. That's that's not realistic. And normally when you say things around affordability and 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 the different modeling, um, I liked what you said when you first came on. You said, you know, it's it's not like a pie in the sky. It's actually something that is feasible. So it was really interesting to hear Rudy say that, you know, this is something they'd like to interrogate, something they'd like to look at. Um, this is what we've been saying since the meeting with the presidency uh, last year. We were saying to them, put people together in a room, uh, economists from both sides, let's have different modelings, let have people test out theories, test out what can be done and what can't be done. So I'm glad to hear that they're finally at a place where actually this conversation is needed to be had uh, because the answer is not that it can't be done. The answer is that actually it can be done. We just need to get to an agreement on how we do it. And while we're here debating that, the reality is that people on the ground are struggling. There are people who are not eating. There are people where, despite our best efforts, not only in terms of government and NGOs, but there are still people struggling. And the longer this debate takes and the longer there isn't a willingness to come to the table and basically say, because the first thing that we need is, is the political will to do this. Once the political will is there, all these other issues, scenarios, what could work, what couldn't work, can um, can essentially be, be worked out if people are committed to making it work. Thank you very much, um, uh, Rachel. There's so much I want to ask you, but I can't because of time. So I have to move on, unfortunately, uh, to uh, Roy Haveman. Um, uh, Roy joined the macroeconomic modeling team at National Treasury in uh, 2002. And in 2009, he moved to the financial sector policy unit where he uh, led uh, a number of post GFC structural reforms. Um, and there's much more I can uh, uh, talk to you about, Roy, about. But I, I would also like to just for him to, to invite Roy just to brief us generally about the, re the reflections on today's presentations and especially also uh, the results of the, of the modeling um, uh, uh, by Ashgar. And if you can just also slip in there, like what, what factors should government take into account when considering different uh, economic modeling approaches on the impact of music? Oh, is that there you are? There you are. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the presentation. I think it's great to be here. And, uh, be asked to uh, I think it's a very important debate. Mm. I think particularly with high levels of poverty and inequality, um, we really need to I think, sit down and work out what is it we do about this and how can we go about doing it. Now, you as the presidency official were very excited to model. I broke out in a cold sweat. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I then quickly pulled up the uh, treasury because I announced somewhere in the budget. I last year's budget, I can't tell you. Um, but if you compare the 500 billion to the other things we spend money on, uh, we spend about 441 billion on all of our learning culture, all the schools, all the universities, um, skills development, and so forth. Mm -hmm. We spend about 250 billion on health. And the total budget for social development is about 360 billion. So that's just to give you a sense of mm. the scale of the five. And that kind of goes, I think, to one of the concerns about it, um, you know, how we think about it from a modeling perspective, um, and not to get too technical, but the problem is when you have such large impacts, fiscal impacts of modeling, you have to start just making sure that your model is simply true. Um, can such a big shock, can we scale up something and, and get to a point where we think such a big shock would actually have the right effect. So I guess I'm the financing guy. I'm really very interested in the idea of how do we finance this. I think 500 billion is a lot of money. Even the medium, the, the middle road scenario, 300, it's still a lot of money. It's, it's comfortably willing to spend. It's basically a doubling of the current social budget. I think when we get to the current social development budget, we get, we get the whole SRD system. So that's 10.5 million people child support grant, old age pension, et cetera. So it is, it is a very expensive uh, strike. But I, you know, I think there's a discussion about what are the different financing options. Um, if you then think about the financing options um, here, what, one of the proposals, obviously the two big proposals, which I think are well, very interesting to talk about. The one is a sort of a, a, a 3% uh, um, 
overall social security tax. Um, great. I think uh, it's important to think about it. It's it's not a VAT. I mean, I think previously we've thought about finding these things this I think is obviously a, a, a tax on wages. Um, just to give you a sense of some numbers there, um, you know, the average teacher earns about 450,000 per year, so they pay about 21, 22% in tax. So that's about 95,000 a year. If you were to introduce that on the teachers and the nurses get about the same, we're looking, and they, they, they kind of make the bulk of the tax base, part of the tax base. We're looking at about a additional taxes of about 14 to 15,000 a year um, on people that are actually already kind of not uh, earning a huge amount. Uh, so then obviously one option is to shift all the taxes up the, the income distribution and to raise taxes at the top end of the income distribution. There, the problems with, with being as we did before, we increase taxes on the top of the rate, 45%. What happened is not every just restructured and sold to companies a lot of tax dodge. So tax has become very a very difficult way of, of change. Um, we can discuss options around wealth taxes, um, which are necessarily bad, bad way of doing it. But I think one of the concerns about the wealth tax idea and my understanding is on the stock of wealth. So I wasn't quite sure if that means that then. You know, are we then running down the stock? Or, you know, so one percent. You know, maybe it's better to think about a wealth tax on uh, the income from the world, which is to maybe extend our dividends tax system a little bit. Um, we actually have a version of a wealth tax property rates, um, which is actually a very efficient wealth tax. Um, so I think there's those all those financing questions uh, to think about. So I think the Maybe the treasure guy has to be the guy and yeah, all sweat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for, very much uh, for those uh, reflections. And I'd like to turn to you, Dominic. Um, uh, Dominic Brown is the director of the Alternative Information and Development. Um, uh, and previously uh, was the economic justice uh, program manager at the AI. Don't have to go. Maybe uh, <laughs> <laughs> all comrades and colleagues. Here. Exactly. So um, now I'm not surprised that the, the treasury guy breaks up in a sweat. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I think is becoming increasingly clear is the overwhelming amount of evidence that the positive contribution of information of a cash transfer can have and how we can progressively expand the realization of social protection in the country. I just want to come back to where we are right now. And based on the medium term expenditure framework and the current budget that uh, Roy Hoverman speaks about, we're actually going to see a dramatic decline in social protection in real terms. This doesn't show as I think we all recognize how this should be expanding quite dramatically if we are to reach the many people uh, that we understand is impacted by huge levels of poverty, unemployment, and inequality. And I think many of us are aware that more than half the population is currently living on an income of below 1,355 right now. So I mean, both overwhelming of evidence that it will have a positive contribution without bankrupting the country. I think that's kind of scaremongering. And two, within the context of this deep socioeconomic crisis, I think it's becoming more and more apparent that there's a bigger risk if we don't implement such a grant. And I think this is the context within which even those within the private sector recognize the important need to implement such an expansion in social protection, albeit that uh, there's a major barrier, I think, and the biggest barrier is in the form of national treasury. And it's quite a breath of fresh air to hear people from the Department of Social Development about the need to break from this testing, to expanding the threshold to, so that more people can actually become beneficiaries and increasing the levels. And so the question then is, um, both in terms of what are the risks if we do, and what are the risks if we don't implement it? 
And I think DSD has, in fact, um, in anticipation of some of the scaremongering of people coming from national treasury in relation to financing it, um, in terms of uh, question of capital flows, questions, I think, of credit rating agencies and credit rating downgrades are all things that we should bear in mind. But I think we need to locate this with an understanding of how we understand the economy, how we understand fiscal frameworks, and how we can potentially look at alternatives to ensure that the fiscal framework can be more protective of the most vulnerable people in this country and potentially advance measures to ameliorate some of these deep socioeconomic crises. And I think the, the question by Rudy cuts to the chase of things because. This relates to government's austerity agenda, which is about the zero sum game that says either you spend on this or that, either you increase the tax to GDP, sorry, the uh, debt to GDP ratio, or you will see uh, 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 massive problems that come to this. This doesn't take into account that there are potentially alternatives, but it's not just about spending, it's also about questions of revenue. And if there's alternatives, just about thinking about where we get the money. And since early after the transition from apartheid, we have seen a dogmatic approach to a tax to GDP ratio of 24%. And this has resulted in a reduction in the potential amount of resources that we could be um, uh, 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 harnessing to, to advance uh, greater redistributed macroeconomic measures. And I mean, we don't even have to look necessarily into new forms of taxation. When we just look at what's happened to personal income tax rates over the past decade and a half, we see a mass decline in effect of personal income tax rates by approximately a third. And so what this means in reality is that if we restore declining effect personal income tax rates to early, early 2000 levels, this is not even about necessarily increasing the tax base. This is about saying who we tax, who we taxing, and making sure that if you were taxed 33 rand on 100 rand, just by way of a simplistic example, in 2000, and you're being taxed 18 rand on 100 rand in 2020, then these means of slowly uh, recuperating some of those lo losses as a result of bracket creep, creep and other forms of tax rebates. This brings in a large level of resources and there's many other potential pools that we can look to over and above uh, a net progress of wealth tax and increasing social security taxes. The last small point I want to make on this is that in as much as again, um, and just by the way, the BIS expert panel, the second report released last year by DSD, did modeling on a scenario based on the um, presidential employment scheme. And it was in fact less redistributed and less impactful in reducing poverty, unemployment and inequality than introducing a, a basic income grant, even with an increased regressive taxation. So that just to show, goes to show that really there's, the, the evidence is there. Uh, the big question is Treasury's unwavering commitment to a fiscal framework that does allow yeah. us to effectively realize the progressive realization of social and economic rights in the country. And sorry, this is what I wanted to say. You can't just introduce a cash transfer without thinking about how we also reindustrialize the South African economy so as to both meet the immediate needs in relation to hunger and insecurities, while also thinking about how we deal with the structural unemployment in the country as part of a broader uh, way of dealing with the, the socioeconomic crisis. Thank you very much um, for those comments. I would like to now turn to, I see Rudy has his hand up. Uh, I'll take I, I, Okay. I mean, I, I have a pro Can you hear me? Perfectly. Yeah, yeah I, have a, I have a problem. If we're here to, to bash national treasury and government, then 
then you know I think yeah. it's important that we don't we don't we don't do that right um, when when Treasury takes the decision around that it is national government that takes the decision around Absolutely. the cost effectiveness of particular sets of programs that we introduce no matter whether you laugh or not about it right because I think it's critical that we understand here that when we want to engage on this and that's why I said to you from the outset I speak on behalf of government right and particularly from the presidency but the president has initiated as Rachel said that kind of conversation whether we agree on the proposals that are there is not here it's neither here or there the question is that we have to find a solution to this as part of an intervention bashing doesn't help that right bashing doesn't help and treasury has a particular role to play and I think that's quite important for us to understand that right neither does it help for us to say presidency says this is very very positive national treasury is very conservative um, DSD says this we represent national government so when we come to you and engage with you it's not about DSD it's not about national treasury it's one government it is the African government that we are going to engage with you about and I think it's important to understand that in the context of what we're trying to do right now and while we're on this panel to have a conversation and a decent conversation because we should engage on the evidence that is there right we should engage on the basis of different views that are there and therefore we need to find a solution that is quite important at the end of the day after that consultation government has to make a decision around what is the best way forward right and I think it's just critical for us to do that and I just wanted to make that point let's not bash each other yet, okay okay um <laughs> okay thank you very much Rudy um yeah I think um it's quite a quite a passionate debate uh and I think uh as a matter of principle I guess uh, you know people are here respectfully to to give their views about um uh a country that uh is definitely in crisis and and for which everyone is trying to figure out how to get through it and and what you know where where are the various stakeholders and what is their positionality, whether that is in government or even um, outside of government where we see contestation. I mean, uh, 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 and so I imagine that contestation is also reflected within national government as well. Uh, uh, you know, we, we can't see government as a, 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 as a monolith. Uh, and so I think that that becomes quite critical, especially as we engage government we can see those fragmentation as, and similarly as they engage us, they can see our fragmentation. So it's about if we are going to be uh, doing things uh, effectively, we need to be realistic about those things. We can't, we can't uh, create scenarios that don't actually exist in, in the milieu of how society functions, right? So I think that, that uh, and I say this respectfully, and it's not a, a mock, or anything, it's just my res uh, respectful uh, opinion. And just so everyone knows, everyone is protected here, right? <laughs> so please don't feel bashed. Uh, we are just having a very spirited debate about what needs to happen, right? The yeah. state of our nation and what needs to happen. So um, yeah, I, 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 I would like to give the floor to you, uh, Ashka, if you could just respond to the, the many things that people have said. Okay. Well. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for a whole lot of notes, um, your comments. Um, I tried to cover some of those and, and think about the rest of uh, uh, talk to you afterwards. Um, starting with uh, Rudy, thank you very much, Rudy, for uh, a number of really thoughtful questions. Um, I, in terms of, you know, you, you obviously write that it brought the inputs into the model. That's why. I started saying here are the you know eligibility conditions that we consider here is the the entitlements so how we you know the numbers the, the that we use and also about the um, the uh, the model does not run just a you know it's not just a micro simulation it's a link macro macro so it needs to have a macro or scenario that these introduction these things happen they're not changing everything at the same time we're just saying well, what if the, uh, there is a macroeconomic outlook, and on top of that, we introduce uh, basic income tax. 
And for that, I mentioned a few of those parameters, but, but obviously if there are, uh, we have more engagement and there is a need for more information about other assumptions that are you know, uh, in the large model like that, parameter values and, and, and specific, would be very happy to provide that. Um, uh, then, um, in terms of the, uh, um, I, I, I also very much agree with the idea that I, I never have looked basic income grant as a silver bullet to solve all the problems of South Africa. I've raised that in many, many times. And if, you, if you're familiar with the work that I have done in the past, we introduced, for example, the six pillar scenarios in 2019 which included the social policy as one of the pillars. The other five pillars were about macroeconomic policy, microeconomic policy, industrial policy, private sector policy, needing all of these different scenarios that we presented at the ETC, A and C ETC, uh, when, when the current finance minister was heading that. Um, and and uh, with the, you know, uh, we had a very interesting, good discussion there, but the point is, that I agree that there are a lot of other things that are need to happen in order to deal with the overall set of challenges that South Africa has. But, uh, but here is, you know, the focus has been on basic income scenario, not necessarily solving all the other, like unemployment problem in the country uh, or the growth problem. Um, so we ran these scenarios and we had a discussions around, uh, around this issue of, uh, with the IEJ about uh, the growth, but right now, average GDP growth scenario of 2.2. For some, it's too generous. I mean, right now, we're sitting at 1.5 average, and 2.2 may be too, uh, too high. And, and, and as you say, maybe it is too generous in terms of employment creation because it is higher than, uh, but we're looking at the rest of the decade, not just next three, four years where the average growth. We say, well, that's historical average for, uh, for South Africa. Real GDP growth is about 2.2%, around that much. So it is not that off the saying that what if that historical average remains? These policy mixes produces that historical average, that pool is there and introduce that. But I, I think you know these what if scenarios that, that you have in mind in terms of you know uh, scenarios about tax compliance, tax policies, other tax uh, scenarios, or presidential employment. I, you know, uh, it can be you know, uh, looked at, and we have looked at some of these you know, in, in, uh, uh, in, in when we consider a wider set of scenarios, more complex scenarios. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, in terms of you ask about whether the current taxation is, yes, uh, is, is the, the, the tax module of the micro simulation model uses the, the current taxations. Uh, we used to have the, the SARS used to use the, the, the model and we had a lot of discussion and training and those modules so we find um, we have you know details uh, very detailed actually uh, tax module uh, in the in the macro simulation component there that takes into account not just the brackets but all the deductions and, and all the processes that were you know uh, there in the code that we used for the, the projection of taxation. And there are many parameters, policy parameters in that area alone that can be one can, uh, uh, you know, use there is, there are, you know, interesting stories to, to, to look at. Um, um, then um, I, I, I think uh, what Rachel said, I, I brought back some, I think it, it's very important that, that in terms of the debate, the mainstream uh, uh, of of view in economics. You know, if you look at economics schools of thought, you know, you have mainstreams and heterodox views. Mainstreams always basically tells you national minimum wage is not a good idea, basic income grant is not a good idea. And any of these things you do, the sky will come down. You're going to be hit hard. And we had that actually during the national minimum wage, as, as Gillard was, was referring to. Obviously, he didn't have time to was focusing on that to elaborate. And, 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 and it was when the expert panel were put together, we had an opportunity to actually contest these different and have the expert panel here, listen to different sides, different simulations that done, different scenarios that were done on national minimum wage impact analysis that we did at ADRS for the, for the national minimum wage. And the others like Department of Labor, Treasury, 
uh, uh, universities had done, and then eventually the, the expert panel, uh, you know, decided. So I, I fully agree that this debate also, uh, you know, can benefit from that widening of the uh, discourse and, and, and from, you know, the uh, having you know, various views heard. Um, I, I uh, wanted to, uh, in terms of what, what Roy said, you know, I, it's nothing I disagree that at all with what the thing that he said. The only observation I have is that um, if you look at the cost of financing of the three scenarios, that we, they all started small and then they graduated. So we're not shocking the economy 500 billion, billion this year. It comes. You're right it, that, that those numbers keep going up. And these are nominal terms, right? 2030, in real value, they also, there, but these are all nominal. But it starts with 100 billion or, you know, but actually it starts with the lowest one, it starts with about 40 billion. And then gradually, you know, shifts. Um, but the, uh, that's one area. The other thing is that um, you see a simulation, the final simulation, but what you don't see, all the simulation that, that sees problem that you were raising. And, and you need to discuss, if this doesn't work, maybe we should do this, maybe we should to solve those reactions in the model that are like a major jump. I mean, these scenarios that you heard today actually evolved to a lot of conversation we had in order to smooth out the scenario, in order to smooth, because now we get the simulation results, we see the jumps happening, we see inflation suddenly, there's a gap between aggregate demand and aggregate supply growing, so we need to. And so we did a lot of that, that, that took the simulation and, and refinement of the scenarios and refinement of the policy in order to, to present, to come up with it. But, but you're very right, these things are very real. And, and, and the same thing you have in the US, the government last year introduced a huge stimulus package. And some within the Democratic Party said it's going to be inflationary, it's going to be all problems, you know, uh, uh, and, and others. And, and it, it created a major shock and they all, dealing with it. So we know that in the model also, these are creating shocks, they shock, but some are smooth, it's able to, you know, we're able to work that out. And, 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 and I think presentation of aggregate demand, aggregate supply growth is very, because we talk about balanced growth, that, uh, that somehow picking that up, I think for me is important. And, and if, this, if that gap growing, you have problem on inflation, you have problem with it, and it's, um, uh, I, I, I fully agree that the, the other suggestion. I mean, one important thing is that what we presented are what if scenarios, as, as you know in the model. You can consider other what if scenarios. The parameters can take different values. So if we come together, we can develop alternative or refinement of the scenarios and run, uh, run the model. So it is not the only scenarios, obviously. Um, uh, but, but I mean, like what you were saying about the well, tax, but it is better to be formed differently on the revenue company. Those are all possibilities to, to consider, but we need some money. We, need, we know the wealth is highly concentrated in the country. It's, it, and, and if there is a, if there is an agreement that wealth tax is a good idea, then the modality of it, or the social security tax. I mean, we introduced the social security mainly on 2028 onward, just to close that gap. Um, so, um, so I, that that also I think is is, 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 is important, and I think uh, what Dominic was saying also about the cash transfer goes back to what Rudy was saying about the, the industry. There is a definitely to deal with the multiple challenges facing South Africa. Uh, this is part of the social policy. Is part of it cannot go without the social policy. I think that is I have done enough simulations work that. You can have infrastructure investment policy. You can change your macroeconomic policy. You can change and create growth, get the growth going, and you're going to have a still high unemployment and high poverty. You need to have social policy. And, and whether it is an unemployment grant, basic income grant, it is very effective to deal with those who are left behind all this current growth that's not really absorbed. Yet. And, and if we have a higher growth scenarios, the revenues will be higher, the ability to afford this become even easier. We did that with the Hindu Lumiti scenarios. That, like, for example, we have scenarios with the Naylor Walk scenario where it's a high growth scenario. In that scenario, where the economy is growing, the tax revenue is also with that GDP growth. We're able to finance 
introduction of unemployment grant, introduction of caregiver grant, expansion of EPWP being paid, being able to, you know, you don't have. But we're sitting at a 1.5 or 2% growth in this scenario, 32% unemployment rate, so an average for the next, uh, next eight years. So in that situation, it would need these other layers to come in. And, and, and if the reward is reducing poverty by 60% or eradicating a, a poverty gap, I mean, the NDP promised that in 2012, uh, and it's a desirable outcome. And, 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 and you know, well, considered. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much to our esteemed panelists as well. Um, lots to debate indeed. And I, Unfortunately, we couldn't get to your questions, but I just want to take a moment uh, to just read them out, uh, the questions that we, we got uh, and the comments, and just so you are assured that um, uh, the team will uh, write responses uh, to, to you on these, right? So Sanele uh, Skei, uh, their question is, I'm interested in the funding mechanism that SA can explore bearing in mind that SA lacks adequate access to education and healthcare, but still needs to invest in inclusive and green infrastructure development. Where can all this money be drawn from? And then there's an anonymous attendee who says, hi, what is the impact of social security on SA's current middle class, short term and medium term? How will this be balanced by the gains of the UBIG? And then another, um, Suraj Mohammed says my, my view on Rudy saying that we should look at several programs is that we have to realize the difference between a big and increasing employment opportunities. The big has the ability to transform the economic growth path and possibly with support from industrial and trade policy, the structure of the economy. The employment stimulus programs, given the current deep structural uh, problems in the economy seems like band-aid. By structural unemployment and inequality, I'm referring to extraordinary high levels of inequality, market concentration, and a dysfunctional social structure of accumulation, not just uh, skills mismatch. And then uh, Suraj Muhammad says, Rudy, the evidence seems to indicate multiple. No, okay, that I will not say. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Um, uh, for this, and thank you so much uh, to to your for yeah for your inputs and everyone's inputs as well. There's much to debate, but I do think that Rachel's uh, intervention concerning some kind of an expert panel um, that is like you know in, in much the same way that the minimum wage uh, um, uh, uh, debate was managed and and what that actually secured in terms of an outcome. Perhaps that is something that needs to be uh, pushed for um, uh, and uh, overseen by government so that because it seems as though there are multiple questions that are being asked around feasibility, about uh, eligibility, about uh, impacts, implications on, 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 on everything, and also variety of models um, as well. So that kind of an intervention would help to distill this so that we can get some kind of clarity. We all just need clarity. Because for many of us, we are clear. But I just want to leave it there and just thank you. And yeah, I'll hand over. Yeah, if, if we, we feel muted. <laughs> we feel muted. I don't have a space. Well, that's fine. Oh, <laughs> yes. That's fine. No, no, they must. Okay, but perhaps can I? Am I sorry? I'm sorry. Do you do you have questions? Yeah, I, I do actually, and it's a very simple, straightforward. Um, national treasury and whoever else out there in the government. What is the cost to the country of not financing this? That's a question that you need to ask. Um, the assumption that the grant isn't going to by the country anything is a false over a number of years in this country evidence and research has indicated quite clearly so positive impact of social grants of any form or kind therefore i think it is important that the fundamental question is asked asked rather what is what is the cost 
to the country not finding it. Let me just leave it. Thank you very much. Yes, also, myself, yeah, because uh, yeah. some uh, the basic proportionality of work takes themselves uh, takes. Remember, it would be wealthy people receive the seeds for so it's all very Dustin Buddha received uh, booster shots for me. So now, how can the government also tell the market economy, the market COVID economy, so that it also try to uh, booster? And uh, uh, create a revenue for text. So, thank you very much. So, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, colleagues. Uh, I think we've come to the end of, of, of the session. Um, the questions that have been asked here, and the questions on Zoom, uh, have been given to the team to ask and others to respond to. Um, we really appreciate the discussion. It's been rich and vibrant. It's a pity we ran out, ran out of time. As a former lead negotiator on the national minimum wage, I can tell you that uh, it's quite a, a huge exercise that we need to embark on around testing the evidence, uh, the issues, uh, et cetera. And I think today we've made a good, good, uh, good progress in beginning to lay some of the scenarios on the table. So on behalf of HSRC and the IEJ, I want to thank everybody. I, I, I don't know if Dr. Jacobs is still around if he wants to make any concluding remarks or any other colleagues from the HSRC, just to indicate that as a way forward, uh, we will be uh, drafting a paper uh, which will uh, take forward the results which uh, ADRS has, has, has developed. And I think the, we welcome further inputs, questions, and so on, which will help us to refine the final product. So watch this space. There'll be a paper coming out at some point in the future, not to be specified. And uh, hopefully we'll have a further uh, discussion once that uh, has happened. So thanks, everyone. I know HSRC has provided lunch, which is outside. And Dr. Jacobs is there. He apparently uh, is going to make a few closing comments. Thanks, Dr. Well, Jacobs. Yeah, th th thank you very much, Neil. And thank you very much for everybody else to, who uh, sort of started out early in the morning, nine o'clock. And just uh, two basic apologies from the HSRC. Firstly, an apology on the uh, little bit of uh, anarchy in the morning and chaos in, in getting colleagues into the venue, uh, but uh, uh, also for you know running slightly over time. But I think there is enough energy and enthusiasm in this uh, forum for colleagues to stay on for the for the brief lunch. And we do hope that uh, everybody will join us in the forthcoming two macroeconomic policy dialogues. The next one, from our point of view, is going to be on the macroeconomic policy of infrastructure. And thereafter, we're going to deal with the macroeconomic policy of public debt. So uh, with those few uh, closing remarks, we really enjoyed working very closely with IEJ. And this, I think, is just the beginning of a very long partnership that we'd love to forge with IEJ as a very strong civil society partner in moving ahead the overarching idea of the HSRC to do social science that makes a difference. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye. I think unmute us so they can uh, say goodbye. I know. I don't know. Bye. Cheers, everyone. Yeah.